Okay. All right, we're going to go into broadcast mode now. So people start coming in. Okay, Ivy, it's all yours. We have seven people attending so far, up to 10. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the town board work session for Tuesday, July 14th, 2020. Uh, we have for you tonight a work session where we will be going through a number of uh, different administrative uh, topics, uh, and then followed by at 7 p.m., our public hearing about our proposed face mask local law. And soon thereafter, hopefully at about 8 p.m., we will have a public hearing on our proposed local law uh, regarding leaf blowers. So uh, Jill, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill Shapiro, who's going to walk us through the agenda for the work session. Jill? Okay, great. Um, so uh, the first thing that, that we've actually got on the agenda is just um, an open discussion of um, face masks. This is separate and apart from our public hearing. Is there anything anyone wants to speak about uh, at, during the work session for this portion here? Nick, anything? Otherwise, uh, I will turn to my work session in earnest. Yep, Jill, the only item I would point out on the... Mm, Nick, we're losing you. Nick, I think we've lost you. So understanding that there's a lot of um, interest in this local, I want to make sure that we um, reserve the majority of our, our comments and conversation for when we have everyone here. The public, yes, I agree. Nick, we can't hear you. Your, your connection is dreadful. Local law. I'll just limit my comments now just to point out the better connection. I presume this is not any better. Okay. Nick, we missed everything you said. And you said. <laughs> okay. Absolutely everything. Now? Any better? Better. Okay. Okay. I may have to go out into my garden. <laughs> so my, my comment was going to be that the um, town agenda package includes a, a local law on the face mask ordinance that is revised slightly from what was initially introduced. And um, I provided the town board with my thoughts and overview and comments on that and where the non-substantive changes were made. And um, I just wanted to see if the town board had any comments or questions on the second draft of a local law. I do not. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? No. Okay. And for everyone who's in attendance, again, we will have our public hearing starting at about 7 p.m. on this proposed local law at which time uh, we will be doing an overview of the law itself, as well as our, our research and findings that support this local law. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> we'll be coming back to talk about this more uh, at, a, at about 7 p.m. So thanks. Jill? Okay, all right. Um, so the first item on our agenda is authorization to extend the building cleaning services contract for an additional year. Um, this is the routine cleaning services for town hall. Um, our contract had uh, three one-year options to extend where this would be the second of the extensions. Um, and we've been very pleased with the company and we'd like to extend them again. Same, um, there, there is a, a CPI increase, um, annual increase built into the contract. Uh, the next is authorization to uh, purchase fire hydrants for DPW. Um, we had actually uh, gone out to bid and secured a new contract for uh, water maintenance materials, including actual fire hydrants. Um, some are for uh, immediate installation and others we keep in stock just in case uh, there's an accident and somebody takes out a hydrant or they find uh, as they are um, servicing the hydrants that one of them just can't be salvaged, they take and they replace it along the way. Um, following those same lines is the purchase of water maintenance materials. Literally every 
uh, screw uh, bolt and coupling that they use to attach the hydrant to the water mains and every place in between has to be ordered special. We go out to bid every couple of years. This is a new contract. And so again, uh, replenishing our stock. Um, as you can imagine, you can't just go to the hardware store and buy this stuff. We have to keep it on stock and we need to have a proper stock to be able to uh, service our hydrants as we go. Um, next is uh, snow removal. I know it's hard to think about it uh, now, but uh, we were actually really pleased with uh, Griffin uh, uh, Services who we um, engaged last year. We had an option to renew it for another year, same pricing, and we'd like to be able to take advantage of that. They were terrific and we're hoping that the weather continues to be as kind to us as it was last year, but that streak's bound to break sooner or later. Um, I had a question about this, Jill. Is there sure. any way to um, adjust the term on this contract so that it doesn't come due in the middle of snow season? So the, the current contract runs through late December. Um, and it just strikes me that- I think it runs through April. I thought the, the term actually went through April. Um, I will take a look at that and see. Um, Drew, do you remember? Oh, she, I don't know if she's here anymore. She helped me draft it last year. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can take here. it offline. I'm still here. I thought it was also at the end of April. Yeah. Um, and I thought it started in November. November through April. Ah, so it's not an annual contract. It's only for that. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe I was looking at that November date. Okay. Oh, maybe. Yeah. It's, yeah, we were trying to capture the, you know, we were trying to figure out like late snowfalls, what do we do with that and all this other stuff. And we, we settled on April and after that we're on our own if we get a May snowfall. Um, but yeah, so um, we would seek to go out to bid probably um, early next year. Got to it. be able to make sure that we've got it in place for the following. Great. Um, okay. And after um, all of that work, it snowed one time, right? I mean, they think we had we had maybe but, one or two. But so storms. so consider it a soft opening, right? <laughs> uh, and it worked like a charm. They were fabulous. They came when they were supposed to. They were wonderful. They were responsive. And we were sorry it didn't snow a little bit more, but um, you know we're <laughs> going to be smarter next time we draft a contract about certain things. But they they were fabulous actually, so um, we're we're really pleased um, because we've tried this before and we haven't been so successful. So it was it, it was a good experience for us. Um, we're actually going out to purchase road striping services. There are. 36 roads that require repainting of double yellow lines and three roads that require painting, repainting of white lines through the center. Um, and uh, safety issue, as we take and re we repave roads, we don't always do the double striping. So over the past several years, the striping gets faded and safety wise, it requires that we put it back, especially like on Roaring Brook Road that we just repaved. To be able to keep people on the proper side of the road. Um, Next is uh, DPW uh, requested in their last budget round um, the uh, purchase of two trailers. Uh, the money has been um, included in the 2020 budget. Um, they have a $35,000 equipment line and uh, these two trailers I think amount to just under $14,000. Uh, next is the purchase of lights for town hall. Um, as part of uh, the um, uh, contract to do the playground and the basketball court out and back. Uh, Bob, Scioli, Bob Scioli always builds in a contingency um, to make sure if there's any overages, change orders, that um, we're able to cover it. And uh, this contract, knock on wood, has been going really well. And we actually have the money for the, um, for the uh, lights that will go all through the parking lot, not just in back, um, but also uh, the parking lot on the side in the front of town hall. Um, in the overage, in, in the contingency from this project. So we actually have funding for it. I think it's 19 overhead lights and then something like 11 of the uh, walkway lights. So the path that goes from the train station to the, um, to the town hall parking lot that a lot of people use to cut through, there's gonna be permanent lighting along that. So we're very excited about that. 
Um, and we're hoping that uh, the playground's actually finished. Again, um, there's work still being done on the basketball court. They're letting the, um, the blacktop, it has to like season for a couple of weeks after it's been paved. And um, we have a construction meeting on Thursday. We're hoping it's like one of our last construction meetings on the project. I'll get an exact date for you. Um, but it looks like it's going to be perhaps the 24th of the week of that last week. Um, let me see. In July. Um, yeah, it's either going to be the, the 24th or the week of the 27th because they first have to paint the basketball court. Um, and we're hoping that's going to be done between this week and next week. And then we'll be able to open it. I'm sorry, sorry Abby. I keep muting myself. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, what is going to happen on the week of July 24th? Um, we're going to be able to, the, the basketball court will be finished and that way we'll be able to take away the, all the, um, the fencing from around the basketball court and the playground. And will we be, be able to use it? A grand opening event or? Uh, well, we're hoping to work that out. Yeah, as soon as I get a, um, a, a definite date, which I'm hoping to get on Thursday, we'll be able to plan something. And so by next Tuesday's meeting, we'll be able to announce it. The Rec Commission Epic. Um, Great. Um, you know, minimal representative representatives of everyone so that we don't uh, run afoul of anything, but uh, not too big on the gatherings, but yes. Okay, we're very excited about it. Um, it looks fabulous. If you have a chance to look out there, it's just, it's amazing. Um, the next is um, we, um, we'd like to be able to um, go out to bid um, using the New York State OGS, it's called a mini bid for a pickup truck and a nascent dump truck, like authorization for that, again, budgeted. Um, this is in the water fund. Um, and the next is um, authorization to uh, purchase uh, two computer systems for police cars. So these are um, older police computers that are in cars right now, but they're operating on Windows 8 and it is no longer supported. So we need to upgrade that. We don't believe in, you know, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, and the next is actually Bob Scioli. Um, we're waiting on Bob Scioli. He's about to come, come on in and he's going to speak to us about the next three topics, which are sort of interesting. Um, as he's coming in, um, I'm just going to jump ahead. He's going to talk about the Route 117, but um, we have an opportunity to rent hand sanitizing stations for the downtown. Um, we're hoping to get them in time for our sidewalk sales days. Um, we think it's important to send a strong message to the public that they have an opportunity to keep their hands clean. Um, we're, you know, everybody's wearing masks and this will make things easier for people. Um, even if they're just walking about and shopping, not going into stores. So um, we're very excited about that. It's our plan to be able to set up three um, of these stations, one on Lower King, one at the corner of uh, one South Greeley, which is King and Greeley, and one by Bank of America. So they're sort of situated. And so then, how uh, are those attached? Do they attach to the ground? Are they heavy? Like they're heavy? They, we, they're not going to be secured to the ground. Um, Jason, do you know how they are secured? Yeah, they're they're relatively heavy units. Uh, they're either going to be two head or four headed units, so it's not uh, they're not moving around. Um, mm -hmm. You know they're they're not uh, tamper proof, but they're 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 large units. Yeah, they're heavy. And if we have a lot of people milling around, they won't like fall over if someone knocks into it, right? No, no, right. These, these are they're made they're made for construction sites. So mm -hmm. yeah, for his... yeah, sounds good. Yeah, heavy duty. Um, and Bob, hold on one second. Um, so ah, payment of building me, usage. How long are they supposed to be there for? How long are we going to? Um, five or six months, Jason? Five? Yep. Uh, well, in about four months. We were, we were planning till mid October, um, thinking that thinking you know people won't be milling around too you know too much longer afterwards. But uh, you know it can absolutely be extended. Um, and uh, as, as the board is aware, we are holding our TOTS camp at the First Congregational Church, which is wonderful. We've gotten some great reviews. 
and this is authorization to pay the Congregational Church for their um, for their space. In our in our haste to get every the camp together and everything like that, we just yeah, so it's gonna take care of that now. Um, let's see. And uh, last but not least is we have a uh, um, a request to ex uh, approve an expenditure. This is um, for student uh, assistance services. This is part of Newcastle United for Youth. They require the town board approval, but the money doesn't come from the town's money. It comes from special designated grant um, that has been um, awarded to Newcastle United for Youth that, that the town just administers. So this is a very, it's a pass through. Okay, um, and then um, the last thing I just wanted to mention to the board, and it was a late, late addition, is, is that there is a resolution that was circulated um, that has to do with the approval of our um, um, approval of a grant application with Westchester County. Uh, the board has been studying the uh, Upper Minkle Dam, which has been um, um, uh, identified by DEC as a high hazard dam. They've given, they, we've made a determination to take and decommission the dam. Um, Westchester County has alerted us that there is up to a 50% match available for our engineering, decommissioning, and actually replanting of the disturbed area. And this resolution um, would request, um, um, is authorization for us to take and uh, submit this um, app grant application and commit to the county that we will be willing to work with them um, in getting this project finished, which we're thrilled over the prospect of being able to do. So that resolution is before you as well. And that's it for me, but I'm going to turn it over to Bob Scioli, who is going to start with um, the punch list items for 117 in Roaring Brook Road. Um, I know that we've gotten a lot of uh, questions from the public as to when are those construction cones going to be leaving that intersection. And unfortunately, uh, we don't have great news on that. So Bob, can you sort of take us through where we are? Good evening, everyone. Um, what I tried to do here is I just went through the state's punch list and just try to summarize it for the board. And I also put it on a, a PDF just to make it a little bit easier to understand for everyone as well. Go through them real quick. Um, I mean, just a little background. Obviously, this is one of the conditions they have to do to satisfy the state so they can get their first CEO for the retail site development plan out there in Chappaqua Crossing. So this is Summit well, Greenfield, Bob? So when yes, you talk about is. them, this is Summit Greenfield. Okay, I just want yes, to- Yes, it is. Them. Yes, it is. This is one of the condition, sure, sorry, Jill. This is yeah. known as condition number 65. Anyway, basically, uh, Ann went out there and they did the improvements to the roadway, they felt it substantially complete. However, uh, in the state's infinite wisdom, they still have things they'd like to see done. So they're kind of somewhat significant, even though they call it substantially complete. So it, that doesn't make sense to me, but that's what they do. Uh, number one, uh, that's for some reason, the plans only call for one foot shoulder out there on the east and west side, going along Bedford Road, 117. They extended it out six feet total width added about another thousand square feet of impervious area unbeknownst to anyone except when Ann did the final inspection she was not I'm sorry that. Ann can, can you just identify who, who Ann is? Oh Ann Dorelius is the New York State DOT permit engineer with the state and she went out there and did her final inspection so she picked up on that one item which is number one so they have to remove it um, they did submit plans just Friday afternoon from Mazer Engineering to remove that. So that will be some traffic impacts when they do that. I don't know when that's gonna be done. I'll keep Jill updated on that when I hear back from Dave Walsh and their team to see when they're gonna do it. But that's one of the bigger items they have to remove. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the stone line swale. Basically there's a stone line swale that exists along the north side of the median going east to west on along Roaring Brook Road, for some reason when they put that swale in, they didn't grade it out properly and it's not picking up the water going into the drain inlet, which was put in there for that purpose. So what happens is the water bypasses the drain and comes down and settles and collects at the intersection of the roadway east of the median, which could be a problem in the winter. 
So that's got to be resolved, and they got to pretty much redo that swale to make certain it's lower than the road. Those are the two big you know, items. That, that's that's actually a really important one because if, as the board I'm sure is aware, there's been a black ice condition at that intersection for forever. And I think people were very excited over the prospect that when this intersection got redone, that the drainage would get redone and we wouldn't have, you know, this really dangerous situation, you know, when you're coming around the corner there. And so to find out that it persists is very frustrating to everybody, I'm sure. But I'm glad they caught it. That was this, that was actually a huge catch. Uh, that was a big pickup on her. So, I mean, those are the two bigger items, which is going to like impact the traffic during construction. Uh, if we want to go through all of them, if the, if the board has any questions on the remainders, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Well, can you talk about the, the stone da the, the stone dust path that has to be removed? Okay. Uh, basically, for some reason or another, I'm not quite sure why, the, when they install the stone dust path, it's supposed to be completely on the property of private property, which is a uh, Chappaqua Crossing. But for some reason, they put pretty much half and half, half in the state right away, half on private property. And uh, the funny thing about it is I showed in one of the pictures, there's actually markers the state put out there and they just still decided to put it where they want to, uh, which is pretty much half and half. So they had to remove about two and a half feet on certain sections. I showed kind of where it is on the plan, which is sheet one with the cladded areas. It's pretty much by the intersection on the northwest side, if anyone has the copy of the plan, and a section where the angle point is um, coming down just south of the site access to Chappaqua Crossing. So they have to remove it and relocate it westerly to keep it wholly included on private property which they did not do. That was um, number, yes. Yeah, no, and, and what about the um, pedestrian um, uh, cross pole that's there? Is, does that need to be shifted as well? Uh, the pedestrian crosswalk on the Northwest Quadrant evidently was not put in the right spot. Um, it was put back too far from the crosswalk. There's certain specific criteria that the state likes to see. Uh, those crosswalks are supposed to be within one foot and six feet. Uh, right now, they're well outside that difference distance. So Anne is requiring them to take some of that asphalt out and move the crosswalk, pedestrian crosswalk, closer towards the crosswalk itself, which is the painted striping area on the roadway. So they have to do that and also lower it too because they didn't put it at grade. They're supposed to be at grade, um, so it doesn't create a tripping hazard. So that's another item they have to do, and that's item number, th it's part of number two on my punch list. So, so um, they're, they're literally removing the the pedestrian beacon, I guess, or, or crosswalk Yeah, basically it's about a 12 foot high pole they got to remove, uh, remove, Jill, and they got to redo the wiring and move it closer towards in an easterly direction, closer towards the uh, crosswalk to make it in compliance with the New York State DOT standards, which are very strict on that because it's a safety item. So they have to move that. Uh, that was that. Um, if you want me to go over more of them, I'll go over them real quickly. Uh, number three, number five, I'm sorry. It went over one through four already. Number five are pull boxes. Those are basically metal boxes that go in the ground where they're supposed to remove the wire and access to. They're supposed to be in safe areas where they don't have to go into the road. Unfortunately, again, I don't know what the contractor was looking at, but they put them pretty much two of them in the road, road right away in the pavement, which is not a good thing. So they may have to be relocated. And then one of them on the south side of the uh, Roaring Brook Road uh, was put for 14 inches above grade, which is a traffic hazard. So that's gotta be relocated. Uh, that was number five. So they have to rip up the, the pavement in the road to move, remove these and relocate them? Uh, they probably have to saw cut a bit around it because it's going to be difficult just to remove them uh, and put them back in. So they probably have to saw cut some of that pavement they had just put down. Um, number six, basically the post spacing she's concerned with. Basically, when they do these post spacings on the guide rails, uh, depending on the deflection area and what's behind the post, uh, they're supposed to either have the six foot spacing or the, or the four foot spacing. Uh, sometimes depending on deflection and safety, you may have to put the post every two feet. So 
And Aurelius wants them to look at that and come back with a plan to make certain the post spacing, which are the horizontal posts, which attach to the back of the guide rail, or in a proper fashion where the deflection is not too much to hit what you're not supposed to hit. So that's number six. Uh, number seven, the shoulders on the east side uh, where the Annadale path is, study is being done. Uh, evidently, there's some sections where they graded it out too steep. Uh, they might have to come back there and redo it and take some shots. Presently, that's what's holding up uh, the Sigma right now to the state. I spoke to um, Peter Rizzillo uh, with Mazer. They have to get some shots back there to see exactly what the grades are so they can correct it to make it match with the state guidelines. That was number seven. Uh, number eight, uh, that's where they have to remove the signs for the New York block, the intersection, because the state uh, did not want those there at all. They were never on the approved plans. I know we tried our best. I contacted David Walsh. I believe the chief wrote a letter up to them as well, but I guess that was to uh, no avail, and they decided that they do not want them. These are the last remaining items for it. These are the signs which have to be taken out. That was number eight. And then number nine, uh, they had permeable pavement, which was put in by the auspices of the DEP uh, because they didn't want too much impervious within a limiting distance of the wetlands and the stream. Uh, however, they haven't been maintaining it. They've let too much debris collect upon the top of it. So they have to really get a street sweeper in there and clean it out and get a vacuum truck to remove some of the debris that sometimes embeds itself into the porous pavement. So again, they did submit this to the state just on Friday at 3.34, uh, but I'll keep everyone posted on when exactly uh, they're gonna approve what has to be done based on their meeting. And Sorry, if there's I, any Bob, meetings, Bob, when yes. you said they submitted this to the state, they is Summit Greenfield and what did they, what did they submit? Uh, basically, Mazer Engineering is, is the consultant for Chapel yep. Crossing. They yep. use them to do all the traffic engineering work so I'm in close contact with uh, Peter Rosillo, who is uh, one of the engineers with Mazer Engine, who works for Chapico Crossing. So um, if they're going to have any type of meeting, uh, Jill and I would like to be in attendance so we can keep in a loop on this and report back to the board in, in more intelligent fashion to see what's going on. Sorry, but right so now, what, yes. what, did, what did Mazer submit? then to DOT? Is it a timeline? Is it a proposed remediation for each of these eight points? What, what it was, was it? it was basically a map showing some of the items that they plan to mitigate to bring it into compliance with the punch list as developed by the state. And do we have that in our packet? No, I got it in 335 on Friday. I, I did not put okay. it in there. I haven't seen it. Okay. So I, I, do have I just wanted to you know, maybe it would be worth just explaining why this is on the agenda for tonight, which is that we, the town board, um, recently received sort of a flurry of emails from residents. I don't know whether it was a neighborhood association that all met and, and uh, decided to do some outreach on this or, or if it just, you know, genuinely became sort of a hot topic for multiple people, but we, we received quite a few emails within the past two weeks on the topic of the intersection of 117 and Roaring Brook Road and questions about why um, it looked like the work was done and yet there's still so much construction debris and cones and so on and so forth. Um, and in sort of our research into what has been happening there and the reason for those cones to, that they remain, uh, we discovered that there was this punch list of items that Summit Greenfield needs to remediate in order for New York State DOT to sign off and approve that intersection, um, which is necessary for us then to be able to issue the certificate of occupancy for the retail at Chapel Crossing. But Bob, I just wanna ask you, is the town meant to be, meant to have played a role in supervising this work that happens here? Or are you just simply updating us on the status of the work between Summit Greenfield and, uh, and um, the state? It's basically an update. We don't have any jurisdiction on that in any way, shape or form. As a matter of fact, uh, when they come into the planning board, uh, we don't get a bond for the state work because that's under the separate New York State Highway Work Permit where the DOT gets their own bond. Uh, so that was not included in the bond for the overall project for Summit. They have their own inspectors. Uh, they have, uh, they consulted out with a, a Mazer 
who did their own inspection services for Summit, who oversaw Montesano, who worked for Summit. Uh, we do not get involved. We have no jurisdiction in, in any way, shape, or form. However, as you can tell, we suffer the consequences when people call up, because they call us up. So we're so, right now going to be looking to get from um, Summit Greenfield whatever the agreed upon timeline uh, and and sort of plan to work through this punch list looks like. Right. That is correct. And I will keep on top of Peter Rosillo, Dave Walsh. And I'll report to Jill so she keeps she can keep a tab on everything, so everyone's on the same page and what we're doing moving forward. And we've actually reached out to DOT requesting to be present at the next meeting when they all decide because we'd like to know what's going on, and be able to just you know monitor the situation. Um, so that was a really long way of saying that those cones are still there because there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> And right. <laughs> it, was, it was not a matter of just picking up the cone and moving it. If it was, it would have been done. We, we were pretty shocked at the extent of the work that was not done either. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, um, Bob, let's talk to you about, uh, briefly about the Westchester County bus stop. Yes, uh, I've been getting uh, calls from Andy Ziegler, who works with the uh, bus division in the Westchester County Department of Public Works and Transportation. And I guess they met out there with the state a few months back <clears throat> and they felt after looking at it and observing what's going on, especially the state, since it's a road, they felt the existing bus stop located on the west side of, of uh, 117, just north of the turning lane was not in an appropriate spot because it wasn't a, quite honestly, not at a good spot for traffic design. Uh, because it interfered with the turning movements going yeah. from southbound onto westbound to Roaring Brook Road. So they met out there basically with the state, Ann again and Peter Ty, who Jill and I know quite well. Um, we They met out there and they recommended to move it to the north side of the main entrance to Summit Greenfield. And I tried to show some pictures. I basically got a screenshot off of Google and put some more in on here to show the board exactly where it's going to go. It's actually an area that's already graveled already. And it seems to be a safer spot too. It gives the bus more ample room to pull off to the right. Uh, and it's in a safe spot too, the north of it. It won't be interfering with the turning lane. So I think it's in a good spot, but they're giving us the courtesy to let them know whether it's acceptable or not. So in discussion with Jill, we felt it was best to let the town board look at it. And if they have any questions or concerns that we can report, I can report back to Andy and let them know what our decision was. Hi, Lisa. What's up? I have a question or a concern. Um, so first of all, there it is gravel over there. It's also a path that goes, um, it's also the beginning of a pedestrian path over there. So I don't know if that is going to be on that path. And second, it's also directly across from Annandale, which people already cannot turn out of. It started again, now that people are driving again. Uh, it's already dangerous there. It's just not a great spot to stop. And, you know, people get annoyed and they try to go around the bus and it's a blind turn there to the left. It's probably not a great spot. So Bob, I know that we had originally approached New York's uh, Westchester County Department of Transportation and really urged them to consider allowing the bus stop to stop within Chappaqua Crossing, actually turning in um, mm -hmm. because, any, because a lot of people like, it, it was just a safer spot. I, I appreciate the fact that where it is right now, it's smack in the middle of the right turning lane. And so it, it's problematic, it, it backs traffic up, and then they're making, you know, trying to get out of the, they're bearing left um, to get out of the right turning lane and causing all sorts of problems. Um, but perhaps we could have a conversation with them. Maybe the chief could join us as well. Maybe Lisa would be on the call with us and just explain that, you know, it, it's a problem for the, you know, for the Annandale entrance. I agree. I agree. It makes perfect yeah. sense. So, um, you know, maybe now's our opportunity to convince Andy and the state that maybe that's not the best spot. And maybe right. I mean, it might make him... Yeah. 
Yeah. It might give them second thought. It might give them maybe an opportunity now to put it maybe where it should go, which would be the best spot, which would be on the site access into Summit, right. which is where I believe the town wanted it to go in the first place. We yeah. all wanted it to go there. And well, maybe, more this is important a, than go, that, ahead, forgetting Annandale, I, I think it should be inside Shopco Crossing. But more important, even forgetting that it's an issue with Annandale is that where it is, people coming south, that's the beginning of that, of like a blind sort of turn to the left. So when the bus stops, which you see all the time, people are trying to weave around the bus. And those bus stops do get a decent amount of traffic because there are people coming who are either working at Chappaqua Crossing or, you know, there's, they're getting a decent amount of people on there. So it's the buses do stop. And then you, there are cars trying to go around the bus because God forbid they stop for a couple minutes and you're heading right into a blind turn. So to me, it's actually super dangerous. I mean, that's part of the reason people can't make a left out of Annandale is because it's a blind turn. So now you're going to have those people who are essentially just going, trying to go around the bus. I feel like it's, it's really a bad spot. I think those are very good points. Everyone brought up and you know what, uh, maybe we'll have a, uh, many Zoom meeting with the chief, Jill, myself and Andy and, and, and convince them otherwise and then follow up with a uh, written summaration of the meeting we have with them and convince them to have it, which is the most, I guess, safest spot to have it on the inside portion of where Summit is. We'd so all, I think that's good. We'd also, Excuse me, need, chief, uh, go we'd also need Summit involved as well. It's their property and they'd have to put in a bus pad. I think that, um... They initially to agreed to it. Efforts. They did. They yeah, did. when this came up last time, I did speak to them and they did talk about it, but I just figured that they should be involved in the next step if we're going back to it. Okay, well, you know what? And Bob, I'm happy to be on that on that call too, just since I know that area pretty well. Very good. That'll be our next steps. We'll set up a meeting with uh, everyone in all applicable parties. Great, terrific. All right, last but not least, um, the TAPCO change order for pedestrian beacons that they've yet to allow us to install? Yeah, basically we, the town board approved uh, so much money years ago on this and, and we, put in, we put in a series of two systems, total of four poles in the Chappaqua Hamlet project. Um, but those are all hardwired, meaning it's all goes exact, goes directly to the power poles. Uh, and they were all readily available in this project because it was downtown. Unfortunately, when we tried to do that up by Langs and out by the North County Trailway, um, the power there is on the other side of the street. It was very difficult to get to, make it more time consuming, trying to get Connett's permission. We'd have to go across the roadway. It'd be more excavation, more work, more cost, more time for DPW. So uh, we felt that it was best just to go with solar, uh, basically, so you don't need any wiring at all. So we're basically, unfortunately, the solar is a little bit more expensive because you have the panel up on top. So it added like another $440 and I believe 24 cents. So we had to get approval on this piece. It was over the uh, amount of money that the town board had approved. So that's what we're requesting right now to get that approved and authorized. It's $440 and 24 cents that uh, hopefully the town board will approve. And then we can write this and um, send the bill to TAPCO and get this done. And are we still waiting on DOT to approve this? Yes. That is nonsense. It makes me furious. Yes, I- Those two intersections are two of the most dangerous intersections for pedestrians in this town. And the fact that DOT has been dragging their feet on this is infuriating. Um, okay. Every time I speak to Anne, I submitted everything she needs. I drop everything I do and I submit it to her within one day. I send it back mm -hmm. up to her. I'm I still know you waiting. Do. My, my frustration is not at all with you, Bob. I know that you've been <laughs> championing this for a long time. It just- Well, thank you. <laughs> really, um, I will be following up on this. But as soon as we get it, I'll let you know, and we have to wait because we can't order the foundations until we get approval from the state because the LHV, who is the foundation company we have uh, already town board approval on, uh, they will not do the fabrication of it until such time we have a New York State Highway work permit. So it's holding up two things. So as soon as we do, I will let everyone, I will let Jill know ASAP and Jerry and Bart as well. 
Okay. Um, and that, I believe, um, concludes our work session portion. And we are ready to, um, well, we have 12 minutes before we start our public hearing. So we can move on to some resolutions if we wanted to. All right. You want me to go? I have them right here. Yeah, if you've got them, whoever's got them. <laughs> I got them. Uh, I move to approve the payment of claims in the amount of $956,792.97 listed on the summary pre-check writing report and detail voucher detail report, each prepared on July 13th, 2020. Checks will be issued and mailed to each claimant listed on Wednesday, July 15th, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to adopt the work session minutes from June 23rd, 2020 and July 3rd, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to hire Christopher Rikers as a seasonal, in, uh, seasonal laborer within the Recreation and Parks Department at the hourly rate of $14 per hour, effective July 15th, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to hire Zoe Coleman as a recreation attendant for the 2020 camp season within the Recreation and Parks Department at the hourly rate of $13 per hour, effective July 13th, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Does anyone else want to go? Um, sure. Um, I move to accept the resignation of Matthew Smith as a laborer within the Department of Public Works Water Unit, effective July 21st, 2020. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to authorize the posting and hiring of the position of laborer within the Department of Public Works Water Unit. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I authorize the extension of the Department of Public Works bid 2018-05 building services contract for another year with Quality Facility Solution Corporation uh, from Brooklyn, New York with an employment cost index, ECI, increase of 2.8%, uh, effective August 25th, 2020, through August 24th, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to award bids for, um, for each individual item to the lowest responsible bidders in each item under the DPW 2020 0-04 purchase and installation of highway maintenance materials bid. This is a service and material requirements bid for fixed itemized prices for a one year period as per the attached spreadsheet. Second. All in favor? Aye. Um, I move to authorize the release of street opening bond to Catherine and Michael Hutchings, 5 Bray Rock Park Road, Mount Kisco for road open permit 2018-0017 in the amount of $750. The work has been completed and it's with, within town satisfaction. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I authorize to release, I authorize, I'm sorry, I move to authorize the release of street opening bond to Leslie Levine and Boris Ivanov Nenchev, 33 Smith Street, Chappaqua, New York, for road open permit 2016-0006 in the amount of $500. The work has been completed and is within town satisfaction. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Jeremy? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I move to authorize the purchase of fire hydrants from Corn, Maine, 1830 Craig Park Court, St. Louis, Missouri, 63146 from DPW bid 2020-01 for the total cost of $14,280.25. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Whoa. Okay, I move to purchase $18,478.60 worth of couplings and hydrant tees from Core and Main LP. $2,036.08 worth of corporation crops from Carmel Windwater and $10,019.84 worth of pipe from Schmidt's Wholesale. The total purchase amount of these materials from the three vendors is $30,534.52. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to authorize 
Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. The renewal of the sidewalk storm removal contract for another year with Griffin's Landscaping Corporation through December 2021 at the fixed rates as reflected below. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I move to authorize the purchase of road striping services for Seneca Pavement, making, pardon me, Marking Incorporated for 24 miles of double yellow line striping and five miles of single white edge line striping for a total estimated cost of $11,190. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to authorize the purchase of a felling trailer FT-121 drop deck uh, drop deck trailer at the price of $6,652.88 and a failings trailer FT10T pan drop deck trailer at the price of $7,257 from Jesco Incorporated. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I move to authorize the purchase of 19 light poles and LED luminaires as well as 12 LED pathway luminaires for the town hall parking lot from Graybar Electric Company in Half Moon, New York through Omnia Partners contract EV2370 for a total cost of $47,914.53. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to authorize the Department of Public Works to utilize the services of the New York State OGS mini bid vehicle marketplace for the purchase of a pickup truck and Mason dump truck in an amount not to exceed $146,905 as per the adopted 2020 budget. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to authorize the purchase of two police patrol vehicle computer systems from patrol PC advanced electronic design Inc for a total cost of $11,390.40 for both systems. This purchase is included and approved in the 2020 capital budget line as indicated. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to approve the TAPCO change order number one for the additional cost uh, for the two solar powered pedestrian systems for the total amount of $440 and 24 cents. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I, I move to approve a rental agreement with call ahead for rental of five safety stands for hand sanitizing for the period of four months at the rate of $190 per month per unit. Antiseptic refills for Dispensers shall be billed at $15 per dispenser in accordance with the rental agreement number 1732944. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I move to authorize the support services for the Newcastle United for Youth provided by Student Assistance Services Corporation Youth Prevention Coordinator from April through June 2020 for a total amount of $9,045.50. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I authorize payment for the First Congregational Church for building usage fees for the 2020 Summer Tots Camp in the total amount of $12,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Why don't you take us home, Jason? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, is, oh, it's it, Lisa. Take it to Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a separate document that had, is the resolution from the Word doc the same as in? Yeah, it's in, it's number 24. You could just do the, the, the bottom there for be it resolved. All right. Um, right, so just whereas Upper Minkle Dam is on uh, the border of the town of Ossining and it needs to be replaced. Uh, no, uh, no, uh, no sorry, not decommissioned. Sorry, decommissioned. Decommissioned, thank you needs to be decommissioned, therefore be it resolved that the town hereby authorizes submission of the grant application to the county for the purpose of obtaining up to 50% funding from the county for this project, including but not limited to the en uh, engineering studies and plans, the decommissioning of the dam, and the planning and replanting of the disturbed areas. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So that two minutes to spare concludes Gosh, the <laughs> work session portion of tonight's meeting. Um, we are going to take a two minute break and we will be back uh, in order to start our public hearing at 7 p.m. Good night, everyone.
Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Oh, no problem. Good night. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you. So for everybody who's just logging in right now, we're just taking about a two minute break so that everybody who's been a part of our work session up till now can use the bathroom or go grab a drink or something. So we'll get started in just a second when everybody's back. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>
Looks like we have almost everyone. Lyle, I've relocated to a, a different place in my house. Is my audio okay? Can everyone hear me fine? Yes. Yeah, it's much better now. <laughs> Excellent. I'm good. Oh, is that because of what I'm saying is different or because of my voice is better? <laughs> they let you come upstairs? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> they let him out of the basement. Okay. Better. I found I found the key. Must be nice. <laughs> Well, I like to go down there sometimes, yes. <laughs> and your video looks fine too. Excellent. Maybe my first time without a virtual background. <laughs> Just waiting on everybody to get back from their bio break. Okay, I think we're ready to roll. Lyle and Carrie, are we all set um, with we the live stream? Yep. Okay. All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome back. This is the town board meeting for July 14th, 2020. Uh, we have two exciting important public hearings on our agenda for this evening. Uh, the first is regarding our proposed uh, face mask local law. Um, can we get a motion to open up the public hearing, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. We can see that there's a lot of people uh, on the line uh, here with us on the Zoom call. Um, I wanted to set a couple of ground rules for this evening. Um, we are actually gonna ask everybody if you can please um, try to limit your comments to about three minutes. Um, we have a lot of people who we know wanna speak on this topic um, and we wanna make sure that we're able to get to everybody. So um, we'll give a gentle reminder at the three minute mark and, and just please ask you to, to wrap up at that time. Um, in order to be able to facilitate this call via Zoom, um, if you would like to speak and would like to be heard at the public hearing, just raise your hand uh, using the raise hand feature um, on the Zoom call. Um, we will not be using the live chat feature, so please do not try to ask us questions over live chat or over Q&A. Uh, the town board members will be giving full attention to the people who are speaking uh, during the public hearing. Okay, so with that said, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of background 
um, on our face mask local law before I turn it over to our town attorneys, uh, Nick Ward Willis and Drew Gammels uh, to walk us through the local law. So we all remember that on June 27th, Governor Cuomo directed everyone who had attended the Horace Greeley High School graduation and the related graduation events uh, to quarantine for 14 days to prevent the further spread of COVID-19 following the outbreak that was the result of a lack of social distancing and mask wearing at these events. Subsequent to that, the Chappaqua Central School District in a community-wide communication that same day said that despite the careful planning uh, and the district's adherence to the New York State guidelines for driving graduations that quote, numerous individuals had failed to follow our protocols. After the quarantine directive, the Newcastle Police Department continued to receive reports regarding parties and other events where social distancing was not being practiced, disregarding the governor's executive orders on mask wearing and social distancing, as well as the quarantine order itself. We all remember that tensions were running high in this community. Over 300 households were in quarantine, many of whom had not left their vehicles during the ceremony and had not attended the parties that were held that weekend. And it was at the behest of our residents that the town board began to explore more seriously our options with regard to enforcement of the governor's executive orders. We consulted with the governor's office, the New York State Department of Health, the County Executive's Office, the Westchester County Department of Health, and the Westchester County District Attorney. As anyone who's been watching the governor's press conferences knows, Governor Cuomo has repeatedly stressed that it's up to local governments to enforce social distancing mandates. On June 15th, he said, quote, if you have citizen compliance dropping and you don't have local governments enforcing, then you're going to see the virus go up, period. Just yesterday, the governor made yet another call for local governments to enforce safety precautions in their region in order to prevent the infection rates from spiking. He said, if you don't do it, the virus will increase. A spike in the virus could put school reopening into jeopardy this fall. So let me be clear. What we are discussing here tonight is not new policy. Our local law is aligned with the governor's executive orders. What we are doing by introducing a local ordinance is simply giving our police department an enforcement mechanism, which does not exist in the governor's current executive orders. So with all that said, I wanna turn it over to our town attorneys, Nick Ward-Willis and Drew Gamels, who are gonna walk us through the research and analysis, as well as the language of the proposed local law. And once they've concluded that presentation, we will again be taking public comments from everybody who's on tonight. So thank you for joining us, uh, Nick and Drew. I'll turn it over to you. Ivy, thank you for that background and introduction. I do want to note for the record that the um, local law is on the town's website. It was included in tonight's uh, agenda packet. It has been made available. The town board members have done a great job circulating and discussing the local law on social media. It's of course been posted and noticed as required by the by law, and there's been some good comments received as well, which I appreciate and help us make sure that the law is, is focused. Sort of help guide the discussion, uh, Drew, my colleague Drew Gamble and I have prepared a PowerPoint. Lyle, if we could put that up on the screen, and I'm going to walk us um, through that. Uh, let me know if I need to slow down or if I'm going too slowly. I will try to highlight some of the legal issues just to put it in context, but not uh, bore, bore anybody. If we can go to the next uh, slide. So the, the local law was introduced and um, has been discussed. There's a purpose of a local law. Uh, the purpose really is to the town's determined, as uh, Supervisor has mentioned, that health risk and economic impacts associated with COVID-19 require enforcement mechanism, um, focusing not just on the health risk, but also to make sure people are comfortable going out and going into the, the stores and shopping. And so the um, requires enforcement mechanism the governor has, as the supervisor mentioned, repeatedly mentioned there needs to be enforcement. There has been a concern uh, by our office, by the uh, Association of Towns, New York State Conference of Mayors, um, county officials that we've spoken with, law enforcement officials, district attorney's office, uh, police chiefs associations, including individual law enforcement officials, as to the enforceability of the governor's orders, especially in light of the fact that some provisions don't have enforcement mechanisms to them. 
and the governor's repeatedly said municipalities should adopt their own enforcement measures. And so this local law before the uh, public and the board tonight for a hearing establishes mandatory requirements regarding the use of face masks and face coverings on public and private property, as well as penalties for the violation. If we go to the next slide, I wanna provide a little bit of an overview, um, just very briefly. Uh, does the town has the authority? That, that is often the question that is raised. How can a municipality require me to wear a face mask? And we don't need to look at current case law. We can go back over 100 years ago to the United States Supreme Court case in 1905, uh, addressing a, a municipality in Massachusetts that required vaccination of everyone in that town to address the smallpox. And it was challenged. It was challenged by the resident to be an infringement of their liberty. I won't bore anyone, but the United States Supreme Court um, in this case, Jacobson held that um, municipalities have the police power, they have the ability to regulate for public health, to protect the public, and that the rights of an individual in society need to be weighed against the rights of the greater of society. And vaccination in that case was found to be uh, appropriate. And if we go to the next slide, this is the case law that is still relied upon by courts when considering challenges to face mask requirements and other requirements, stay at home orders, for example, during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there have been challenges both in New York State and across the uh, nation to a local governments, a court, a judge, or a governor's issuance of various orders um, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, up on the screen, you'll see one case, McCarthy versus Cuomo, where there was a challenge to um, a number of uh, the governor's executive order, including 202.17, which requires face masks to be worn in public. And the court there determined that the plaintiff had failed to demonstrate any success on the merits of her claims and recognized, citing the uh, over 100 year old Supreme Court case, that the community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic of disease, which threatens the safety of its members. If we go to the next slide, you'll see there's even a case out of Maryland um, where the court relied on Jacobson again on a challenge to a governor's order requiring masks to be worn, prohibiting gatherings and requiring people stay at home. Many of the same orders that we've seen here in New York issued by Governor Cuomo. And in fact, the, the judge noted that to overturn the governor's orders, those who disagree with them must show that they have no real or substantial relation to protecting public health or that they are beyond all question a plain palatable invasion of rights secured by the fundamental law. And the court of Maryland, as well as the court in New York and other courts, both state and federal courts, have all held that in instances like the current COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, municipality has the police powers ability to regulate and that such stay at home orders, face mask wearing are all uh, legal and do not infringe on liberty and pr um, private rights. If we take a look, Lyle, at the next slide, it's gonna talk about the use of the police power. So uh, there's a concept in, in New York state law and it's codified in the New York state municipal home rule law that municipalities have the power to adopt and amend local laws, not state laws, but laws unique to their municipalities to protect the general welfare and safety and health of the constituents, the members of that community. And going back to the Jacobson case, courts have recognized that an enactment of measures to protect public health is certainly an appropriate one that can be exercised. If we look at the next slide, the, um, when the government, another case um, from California from May of this year, that courts were upheld face mask, and again, unless there's no real or substantial relation to public health, or the measures are an invasion of rights secured by fundamental uh, fundamental law. We can go to the next slide, Lyle. It's, it's our opinion that based upon the plethora of case law that has been out there since the COVID-19, that the town has the inherent authority to exercise its police power to enact the legislation that the governor has encouraged municipalities to enact, and which um, courts across the country have upheld as being within the appropriate authority of local governments to enact. I'm gonna take a moment to, to look at the governor's orders and the town's law because both the governor's order and the town's local law, the proposed law, require masks to be worn in public, in businesses, in offices, and on private property. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see where there are uh, the, the executive orders that require all that. I'm gonna get into a bit more detail in a moment, but over the past four months, the governor has issued multiple executive orders concerning the use of face masks and face coverings. You see them up on the screen, they're available on the internet. I'm gonna explain them in a bit of detail in a moment. I also wanna mention that this is an ever-changing area of the law. And while the governor has said municipalities should 
um, issue of her own enforcement mechanism, adopt her own rules and rules and regulations, and Newcastle is, is the first in the state to do so by our understanding, and we've received support from uh, officials that we've spoken to that this is the right move to make. I also note that the um, Department of Health has issued uh, regulations on July 9th that are only just now uh, being introduced and being circulated, where the Department of Health is itself uh, following the governor's lead and issuing enforcement mechanisms. If I could jump in, Nick, you mentioned the Department yep. of Health, uh, their enforcement rule. We had a call, I think you referenced it or Ivy referenced it about two weeks ago in uh, the Department of Health Council, uh, the governor's office, general counsel, uh, state deputy commissioner of health, I believe was there, a representative part of me, folks from the county were there. And we, along with you and some people with the town expressed our concern uh, that there was no state enforcement mechanism. And certainly we didn't want to arrest people and rely on the penal law then. And we certainly didn't want to do it now. We brought that issue up with the state. Is that, do you, re do you recall that conversation? <laughs> That's correct, Jeremy. We did. We had very sufficient from the state. We had um, asked questions about enforcement because we were hearing concerns in our municipal practice from a variety of communities. And with the incidents at the high school graduation, we wanted to make sure that the police had the full authority should it should never become necessary to answer questions from the public about the enforceability. And during that conversation with state officials, and these weren't low levels of officials, these were um, the, the governor's counsel's office, the head counsel of the Department of Health, as well as uh, appropriate mm -hmm. commissioners from the Department of Health. They, in response to our questions, while they said it could be enforced, when we dug down into the details with them, it became apparent and they recognized that the enforcement mechanism was not there in the, um, in the governor's orders or in the uh, regulations that had been issued up until that point in time. And it was after that call, because of that gap or that void, we spoke with you as a town board to say, hey, Nick, we need to craft a local law that addresses this empty space to enforce the, sport, enforce the executive orders. That's right. We took that next step. After our call, when we sort of threw our hands up and said we don't have it in the state, while they say we have it, we also, on the other hand, recognize we don't, that was when the board requested that our office uh, look into and draft a local law, which we then did, what, two weeks ago. Yeah. Without, without overstepping, I think it's safe to say that, you know, Governor Cuomo, uh, certainly New York State and Governor Cuomo have, have been leading the charge and, and Governor Cuomo arguably personifies that charge in terms of addressing and managing and finding answers in terms of public health to COVID-19. But um, there was no discussion at that point about any draft regulation. It wasn't as if we showed our hand as this is what we're considering doing. This was more of a Q&A and helping us. We did not reach that point to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. What are your thoughts? And I, I say or share that with you, or I, or I say that because, you know, certainly you can't say Newcastle what was a reason why this happened, but I think it's a catalyst, at least this new Department of Health guideline, is that we're a catalyst by asking those questions, identifying the issues that they couldn't answer to move the ball forward to try to rectify that void. Yeah. I think it's a fair point, Jeremy, that during that call, the governor's counsel's office and the Department of Health's counsel didn't say, uh, you've raised valid points and we have an answer and a solution and we're working on it. In fact, they were, they were silent on it. And we've had subsequent calls after that call with other officials in the state and the officials who are involved in advocacy organizations. And they noted that there wasn't any and they encouraged us to adopt this law because there was that, I call it a gap in the state coverage. So I'd like to think sort of where you're going that our discussions and the introduction, introduction of this law has been somewhat of an impetus for the Department of Health to fill that void. It was frustrating and it remains frustrating, I'm sure to many municipalities that if, if there is no specific mechanism, you're asking your police officers, potentially if, assuming that it fits the law for, to arrest someone for public nuisance or obstructing government administration or disorderly conduct. And some of the other public health laws weren't specific to the individual mask wearing requirement. Well, that's exactly right. In, in a number of municipalities, that's the resistance we were getting was, it was almost as though the police were being compelled to jerry-rig a charge to enforce the, um, the mask ordinance, whether it was disorderly conduct because there was social gathering or coming up with a state health regulation that didn't quite fit the solution. And there was concern, legitimate concern on behalf of law enforcement as to what to do, which is why this local law uh, provides clarity. It's your own local law. You have the absolute authority to do so. You don't have to rely upon someone questioning whether the governor has uh, introduced the executive order correctly. 
on procedural grounds or if the Department of Health has a procedural authority to issue emergency regulations. The uh, town's ordinance is well within its authority. There's no preemption. The town law is consistent with the Department of um, Health and there's not enforcement. In fact, you know, the governor is encouraging municipalities to do exactly what Newcastle is doing. And Thank you. Okay, so if I can continue, well, if we can jump to the next one, and, and it's a good transition because, you know, Newcastle is doing what the governor has suggested and consistent with uh, various executive orders. We took a look at the next one. So I mentioned the, uh, we mirror it in, in many respects. 202.17, the executive order, most people are familiar with, requires that a face mask be worn in public, right? Any individual is over age two and able to medically tolerate a face covering shall be required to cover the nose and mouth with the mask or face covering when in a public place and unable to maintain or when not maintaining social distance. While the next one, we're gonna go through pretty quickly through these. The next one is section 202.18. That's the executive order that required face covering or face masks be worn when on public or private transportation. And if we go to the next one, 202.34 requires that a, a face mask or face covering be required when requested by the owners of those property to be worn in businesses and offices. And I'd note that um, that order 202.34 of the second bullet point on that slide notes that nothing this directive shall prohibit or limit the right of state and local enforcement authorities from imposing fines or other penalties for any violation of the directive in executive order 202.17, which is exactly what this local law does. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see a more recent executive order issued on June 15th, 202.45, which um, Expanded upon a prior order limiting gathering, you may recall there was a limiting on gatherings initially started at 100, then it dropped down to 10, came up to 25, and now because this, uh, our region is in region four of the New York forward plan, it's up to 50. So 202.45 modified prior executive orders to allow gatherings of 50 or fewer individuals for any lawful purpose or reason, so long as any such gathering occurring indoors does not exceed 50% and provided that the location of the gathering is in region four, which we are, but it continues and provided further that when you have this crowd of up to 50, that social distancing, face covering and cleaning and disinfection protocols required by the Department of Health are adhered to. And that executive order isn't limited like 202.17, which said uh, when in public wear a face mask or 202.34 that said, if required by a business or an office, you have to wear it or, or you can be compelled to leave. 202.45 goes beyond that and says, wherever there is a gathering, whether it's on public property, whether it's on private property, quasi-public property, quasi-private property, you must um, uh, maintain, you mu can't be any more gathering of 50 people, more than 50 people, and you must maintain social distancing, face covering, and cleaning disinfection protocols required by the Department of Health. So if we go to the next slide, now, we've sort of established the conformity between the governor's executive orders, regulation on public and private properties, and um, the town's code. This slide talks about why does the town need to adopt a local mask board mandate. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think we've discussed it with your comments, Jeremy, and Ivy's introduction, some of my earlier comments. But a key point is that the state has not established penalties for violations of Executive Order 202.17, wear a mask in public. 18, wear it while on public transit. 34, wear it in the business if requested. Or 45, wear it when you're in a gathering and you can't maintain social distancing. In 45, there is an enforcement provision for violation of gatherings only. Um, so there was nothing up until the Department of Health regulations uh, issued today and up until Newcastle who introduced this law that had any teeth to the law. All you could do, for example, if you're on public transportation is ask someone to put it on. If they didn't, you can then ask them to leave. And then if they didn't leave, maybe then you have a disorderly conduct charge. So um, uh, that's why the town is taking this step. And again, the two, two next two bullet points, nothing that limits the state uh, and town rather from enacting this law. And Governor Cuomo has repeatedly stated that it should be enacted. So if we go to the next two slides, we can skip the, the first one. It's just a nice cover transition. We're going to now talk about the town's local law. We've got a couple of nice graphics there. Uh, so I'm going to go through the local law. Section 86.1 has a number of findings and purposes. Uh, I'm sure people have read the local law. There's sections A through A, A through I, that sets forth why is this law being enacted and certain findings and purposes, all related to what I think people have heard from various 
um, local governments, state governments, county governments, health officials, whether it's the Department of Health, state, county Department of Health, the face mask serves a, a, a legitimate valid public purpose. And uh, therefore this local law is being adopted to ensure that those masks are worn when, when required. And that's section 86.1, I'm not gonna go through that. 86.2 is your requirement that uh, definition rather as to a mask and, and face covering, what does it include? And there you've got the text as well as some examples. And to go to the next slide, Lyle, it goes to section 86.3 of a local law. So this is the law that section below says face masks or face coverings required on public property. Very similar to uh, executive order 202.17. Where it's a little different is that we've actually defined social distancing. It's a little bit of a vague phrase. So for us to enforce it, we want to define social distance. So that's, that's why the law says when uh, the key phrase is when unable to maintain a distance of six feet from another person who is not a member of the same household. So that is the, the operative language and that's the social distancing. So that's, um, to go to the next slide, that's one on, required on public property, similar to 202.17. The next 86.4 requires it on private property, whether it's an office, whether it's a business, or whether it's in a in a back in a backyard. Um, again, when you're unable to maintain a distance of six feet from another person who is not a member of the same household, this really is no different than Executive Order 202.34, 18, or 0.45. And let's go to 86-5. The next slide, Lyle. We unlike the executive orders, you know, we have some exceptions. Um, we have additional exceptions just to clarify. So. Face masks or face coverings should not be required to be worn by a child under the age of two or anyone who is unable to medically tolerate it. Um, subsection B, um, not required if individuals maintain a distance of at least six feet from another person and that individuals who reside in the same household shall not be required to wear a face mask or face covering if located within six feet of each other. And then uh, drivers traveling alone or exclusively with members of their households in a motor vehicle do not need to wear face coverings. Lyle, the next slide, the exceptions continue. Uh, persons playing a sport, that's consistent with um, the practical aspect of it and also consistent with the guidance that's been issued by the Department of Health as part of the governor's New York forward plan. And likewise, while one is um, seated and actively uh, eating or drinking, you can't um, you know, be popping Skittles and walking uh, through Main Street and taking uh, 30 minutes while you go finish that bag of Skittles and claim that's actively eating or drinking, that would be inconsistent with, with the law. There's also an exception for emergency um, uh, firefighters. We've also, if we go to the next slide, um, unlike the, the, the governor's orders in section, next slide 86.6, we talk about an exemption request. So there is here an ability that if you don't fit within that exemption, you think there's a, a reason why, you can apply to the chief of police of the town for an exemption and the burden is on the applicant show, to show the hardship or the impracticality of complying. If um, it's granted, they'll be granted an exemption. If it's denied, they have an ability to appeal that to the town administrator whose decision shall be final and they can appeal that within uh, 10 days of the denial. And so they're giving them two bites of, an of the apple an opportunity to establish an exemption. And then uh, Lyle, if we go to section, the next slide, 86-7. We've spoken about enforcement. That's the reason this is being enacted. Uh, it's still required, notwithstanding the uh, adoption of the Department of Health rules, because again, I think there's still some procedural questions as to the legality of the enactment of the Department of Health rules to govern the executive orders, which are the foundation for the Department of Health regulations. And um, the town certainly has the absolute authority to take the steps that are contemplated to be taken in the local law. And um, so the law in section 86.7 provides for enforcement by the um, police department in section A. When is this local law applicable? When can it be enforced? It's during the time that a declaration of emergency is issued by the town supervisor, so not any time, but during narrowly tailored, during an epidemic or disease outbreak, that is communicable through droplet contact or airborne transmission. So it's narrowly tailored to the, to the issue at hand. And then it provides for uh, penalties of fine of up to 250 for the first violation and up to 500 for any subsequent violation. And you know the town obviously wants to get adherence and compliance through people voluntarily complying. So what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to, uh, to Chief Carroll 
Be before you and, do so, uh, sorry, Chief, but before you do so, Nick, I just want to clarify, mm -hmm. I've stated again, that up to is a critical term in the statute. A, a sanctioned person or a person who has to respond to a summons if found guilty or a plea does not have to pay, it's not mandated, $250 or ultimately, if again, $500. A prosecutor has discretion to find that person $1. That is correct, and the court as well. So the discretion really lies in two areas, and it also provides the individual the opportunity to try to mitigate those penalties and explain why it should not be up to $250. Uh, and there could be a variety of reasons, but you're right. It provides the opportunity for the individual to advocate for a lesser amount. It also advocates, allows for the judge or the prosecutor to work within up to that amount. So Chief Carroll, if you don't mind uh, offering us some of your thoughts and comments with respect to enforcement. Under the local law. Sure, thank you, Nick. Uh, first thing I would do, like to do is um, thank the board for uh, their efforts on this. Um, in my opinion, they're closing a loophole to the governor's orders that um, you know was handcuffing us and now gives us the ability to have a mechanism for enforcement. So thank you on that. Some of the questions I, I think are out there that most people are asking are, you know, how are we going to enforce it? You know, what, what's the police department going to do? So um, we will take action if we observe it in public. Um, will we, we will respond to complaints from the public on private property or public property? Um, are we actively driving through neighborhoods looking for social distancing violations, you know, on private property? We are not. Um, will we respond to one if we receive a complaint? Will we handle one if we observe one? We certainly will. Um, another question I think that's out there is um, what about driving in a vehicle with um, my friends? you know, are, are the police department pulling us over? So we won't just pull you over for that. We would need probable cause for something else or a vehicle and traffic violation to pull you over. If during that traffic stop, we did determine that you weren't members of the same household, could the officer issue a summons? They could. Um, they also have discretion not to. So, and in police work, like everything else, um, everything's fluid and changes. So it's based, based upon the individual circumstances of the stop. Uh, Another complaint I had is, um, can we issue for a violation that didn't occur in our presence? So this criminal procedure law is, is clear. A police officer cannot issue for a violation that does not occur in his presence without a warrant. Technically, is there a mechanism that if somebody wants to make a complaint, um, a summons could be issued? Technically, there is. Somebody could come in and provide a supporting deposition. We could file an information with the court. The court could determine if there was probable cause and they could issue a criminal summons um, or an arrest warrant. Uh, but that's a, a lot of steps to go through and, and I, I wouldn't recommend it for somebody doing it, but there is a mechanism to it. Um, you know, the overwhelming majority of the town is adhering to social distancing or wearing a mask. They, they are, it's, you know, the violations are the exception, not the rule. Um, what are we seeing out there? Uh, you know, sometimes it's in Getty Park where you have two moms and three young kids and they're good friends and they're comfortable with each other. So they're, you know, not wearing a mask. And, um, you know, with the discussion from the officer, it's voluntary compliance. Uh, and our young adults were seeing complaints about, you know, last night there was some in uh, Smith Park, four, four of them up there that weren't wearing masks. Um, Amsterdam Park was another example. There were out there today. Um, so, so they are happening. Rockies, we've had some complaints about there. The Chicos and groups are out there. So if we do have a group that is violating more than anything, and, and um, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, ask our parents to speak with them and advise them of how important this issue is. Um, but um, that's basically our plan or our thoughts, or I hope answering some of the questions. Any questions from the board for me? None for me. No. Um, oh, Jeremy. If, uh, in terms of age of people you wish summons to, do you have a particular guideline you follow? And then I, and as a second question, unrelated, can you just clarify without giving a tutorial, you're not uh, you know, a law professor or a judge, but you, know, you can't just waltz onto people's property and into their house on a violation. There's no edges in circumstance, there's no warrant. And to further what you said before, um, if you're not observing something, you can't issue the summons barring that 
witness coming in, signing off on documentation, a judge issuing, taking the next step, drafting a complaint or an information. So the two questions again is sort of the age issue. Is my 12 year old gonna get summons? And then the other issue being just very, very briefly about how you can't just charge into people's homes. For sure. Um, recently, the Raise the Age legislation um, uh, changed the age of an adult to 18 for an arrest. But for violations, I can issue anyone 16 or above. So 16, 17 can be issued for a violation. So that's the age. Nobody below 16 will be issued a summons. Um, as for someone's home, we receive a complaint. Would we, you know, could we walk up in a, a door and knock on their door? But our, our, um, if they let us in, fine, that would be their decision. We are not forcing our way into anyone's home. We are not seeking a search warrant to enforce this local ordinance. Um, if we pull up and there's, you know, 60, you know, people on the front yard and they are not social distancing, do we have the right to go on the property and, and investigate? We absolutely do. Thank you, uh, Chief Carroll, for, for your summary on enforcement and, and Nick for your uh, really thorough presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, one, one, one additional comment I would add is just for the record to note that the town board, and it's included in the agenda pack and certainly in the public documents, have received um, a memo from the police chief in support of this law and explain the reasons why, as well as from the uh, park superintendent in support of this and explaining the reasons why. I believe there's also been a support from the from the library, from a store in town, as well as from um, uh, one of the religious organizations as well that are all part of the record, as well as other public comments and emails received by the town board, all included in the record. Correct. Thank you. So with all of that said, um, this is a public hearing, so it's time to turn it over to the public. Um, Again, if you would like to make a comment, we ask that you please try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. Um, the way to let us know that you wanna speak is to raise your hand using the Zoom feature. So I can see that we've got two people who already have their hands raised. Um, so Lyle Anderson from NCCMC is with us and he's gonna be helping to Bring people over from attendees to panelists so that they can make their comments. Okay, first one is uh, Barry Zizi. He's first in line. Uh, Barry, make sure you take your um, mute off. And um, if I can just speak, we're going to have this. This is limited to three minutes for public comment. I'll be keeping time. Looks like Barry may have. Okay, well, he can come back on later if he wants to. Um, oh, there, I think. The next one is uh, Lori Morton. Make sure you gotta mute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. can hear you. Great. I'll go ahead then, thanks. My name is Lori Morton. I am a Chappaqua resident and a Regeneron scientist. In addition to my regular work, I lead research on the mechanisms driving COVID-19 morbidity and mortality, as well as serving on Regeneron's return to work task force, which develops protocols for maintaining a safe workplace for our essential laboratory personnel. I also serve on the CCSD return to school task force. Thank you for the invitation to share my insights and public comment. The primary mode of community SARS-CoV-2 transmission is the inhalation of respiratory droplets emitted by the breathing of an infected person. Virus accumulates in the respiratory fluids of infected individuals. Virus particles are not mobile on their own and rely on the respiratory particles to move between hosts. Likelihood of infection is driven largely by dose of virus. The greater the exposure to the respiratory droplets of an infected individual, the higher the dose of virus that can be inhaled by the exposed person. If you wanted proof that respiratory droplets exist, you need only to observe the sensation of humidity experienced when wearing a mask. This in-mask humidity should also serve as reassurance that mask wearing is preventing the escape of respiratory droplets. Coronavirus is still active in Westchester. Just under 1% of all tested individuals in the county are positive for the virus. 
in regular workplace testing of approximately 1,500 asymptomatic essential workers at Regeneron, 0.14% are positive for SARS-CoV-2. Masks and social distance requirements are strictly enforced at Regeneron, and there have been no cases of workplace transmission during the duration of on-site testing. With nearly 1 million Westchester County residents, this suggests that between 1,400 and 10,000 virus positive individuals reside among us, each with the potential to launch a reinvigorated outbreak. There is no reason to believe that Newcastle would in any way be isolated from this threat. It has been clearly established that without protective measures, asymptomatic carriers of SARS-CoV-2 are able to transmit the virus to others. We have evidence for this in our own community. This means that individuals can unknowingly and without bad intent put those around them in danger of infection. Our collective frustration and impatience to have life return to normal is palpable. However, there is no return to normal on the immediate horizon. Instead, we need to adjust to a new normal in which we can expand access to businesses, recreation, child care, and schools by working together to conduct, conduct these activities as safely as possible. Nose and mouth coverings are an essential component of this plan. Without the public adherence to this simple precaution, local and national data demonstrate that virus resurgence is fast and dramatic. But this return to work requires a collective commitment to good practices that recent events have shown us cannot simply be trusted to the responsible behavior of all. There will continue to be those who feel their opinions trump known facts, that their vision of personal liberty supersedes the greater good, and those whose loneliness and boredom drive participation in ill-advised gatherings. For this reason, there is a public health imperative that drives the need for enforcement power behind the state legislated mask requirement. And I am grateful that Newcastle Town Board is taking the lead to make it so. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Lori, Ms. for those comments. Before um, Lori leaves, does she have um does she have this in a written statement that she could email to us? That would be very I helpful. Did. Yes, I have, have done already. so already. I emailed okay, a thank longer you. version with more okay. detail. We, <laughs> thanks we, so we much. received it earlier uh, as we were meeting. Okay, thanks. Christina, might you have a sign that says yes. time that might be a little bit easier? Oh, just I to, can just make one. Okay, fine, thanks. Yeah, okay. Okay, the next person is Michael. Yeah, hi guys, uh, Mike Schoonmaker. I should be fairly quick and I have um, probably more questions than, um, th than comments. It, it, it strikes me that uh, given the fact that this is the, the first kind of legislation in the state that we should probably exercise some, some extra diligence and, and my questions are really pointed towards, towards that. You know, are we doing something that is maybe unnecessary. Maybe we can use the tools that we have currently to achieve the, the same ob objective. Are we potentially unnecessarily infringing on kind of, you know, private rights or, or liberties when we, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, private property? And then also, lastly, unintended consequences. Want to make sure that we kind of consider that as well. And so the, the first question is with respect to the necessity of the law. And, and if we, we tie it back to what happened at the Greeley graduation, it's my understanding, and maybe I, I'm lacking kind of full knowledge of the scenario, that the police officers did not ask the students and the parents to, to go back to their cars. And I suspect if they had, they would have done that. And then maybe we would not have had an issue. So, so I'm wondering if you know the legislation that we're propo proposing is maybe not necessary if we do have law-abiding citizens and as Chief Carroll mentioned, you know, we, we expect voluntary compliance. And when we ask people to do things, they do it because we have a law, we have a law abiding town. So I'm, I'm curious as whether there are any instances where there was an alleged violation and we've asked people to do something and they said, no, we will not do that because there's no enforcement mechanism. I, I suspect the answer to that is no. Um, then on, with respect to uh, private property, I'm, I'm curious as to whether there's any data that that shows that um, you know house parties or whatever it may be are leading to uh, spreading of the virus. You know, I know I understand that there's been some reports that there are private house parties and maybe people aren't wearing masks. But is there a kind of a direct correlation between that and 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 occurrences? Again, if, if we look at the Greeley instance, that was not a private house party. So we're we now have legislation which goes beyond I think the instance which 
caused us to, you know, think about the legislation in, in the first place. And then lastly, unintended consequences. Uh, I'm curious here, you know, for the underrepresented, maybe the mi minority population, have we considered the impact on, on, on that group? I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're in a situation now where, um, you know, we're encouraging our residents to kind of report on each other and that could result in an un unintended consequences, you know, neighbor on neighbor reporting. And I just wanna make sure we're being uh, conscious of our uh, minority population as well. So I'll, I'll stop there and let you guys respond. I'll jump into it a little bit and the chief may want to jump into it. And I only took, Mike, I only took a few things down. So I apologize if I missed something. One thing it's not, graduation wasn't the catalyst by itself. And, and I think we'd be naive to think that this is only a graduation issue, meaning people are having parties, people are getting together. There was other events that were cited or at least one event that was cited, but th that would be, I know in my, in, I've seen parties with people in not in my specific neighborhood, but walking around, um, um, one with a decent amount of people, well, well above just a few and family members. Um, so I, I don't think we should say the catalyst was solely this. That being said too, I think it's incumbent upon us to address the issue and look at what I believe, although I may be overstating, but I think I'm comfortable in my assertion that the Department of Health, after we reached out to them and mentioned our concerns and had our issues, partially addressed what we said was lacking. So you know, leading by example and instituting a law that may not be necessary 100% here, but arguably it's necessary everywhere. Um, in terms of like house parties and things like that, I may have the state wrong, but I believe in the, for example, in the past week or two, there was a young man who went to a coronavirus party to get coronavirus, and I want to say it was Alabama, um, who passed away uh, because he caught the, the, the disease, the virus. Doesn't matter if you're from Alabama or from New York or whether you're 18 or 32 for that matter. Um, and then the other piece, and I'm sorry, I'm just, oh, um, about um, you know being concerned about encouraging people to rat on other people. How often are you calling, texting with texting and driving has been a huge issue in all communities, but I know it was a big enforcement issue and we led on that front as well. Uh, some have said it's worse than DWI. There are a lot of people who have horrific accidents and people die, um, you know, for texting while driving. Uh, in fact, this past weekend, I was in New Jersey walking distance from my brother-in-law and someone was looking at her phone and I said to her brother, we got to move, we got to move, we got to move. We walked onto the, to the grass because this person wasn't looking. So I don't think all of a sudden we're going to be in this, you know, sort of fascist regime where people are ratting out their neighbors, you know. So I think that may be a little bit extreme. I think that most people will address it and deal with their neighbors or say something. There are countless incidents. You know, people aren't calling the neighbors when there's noise violations with regularity. Maybe when there's, you know, kids drinking on their property. Uh, there's countless examples, I think, that we could find and say, yes, the law is there. It doesn't mean that neighbor rats neighbor. Um, I hate to even use that term, but tells on neighbors. So I, I think that to a certain extent, some of those concerns, while they're legitimate, they're somewhat straw men, meaning I, I don't think that's really... I don't think that the conclusion you're drawing is, is accurate. Um, so I, that's that's my response, so. Um, I've, I've got two points, so I want to tag on to Jeremy's comments. Um, what happened at the Greeley graduation wasn't uh, the only, um, you know, infraction, as we'll call it, uh, that happened, right? There was uh, pre-parties, post-parties, field nights, uh, and other things, and of course, all, all the uh, all the things that have led up to it in terms of uh, vacations uh, and lack of social distancing after people coming back from vacations. So it, it isn't solely um, the, the high school graduation. Uh, and one other thing I'd like to bring up, uh, you know, talking about you know evidence of this. Uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, has a daily newsletter out today. It was at uh, 6:02 p.m. I happened to be able to take a look at it. Uh, right in the front, he, he mentions, here's a true story about how quickly COVID can spread. There was a 4th of July party in Suffolk County. At least one person was COVID positive. Since the party, over 20% of the people who attended that party uh, have tested positive for the virus. It only takes one person at one party to, uh, to spread COVID. Wear a mask and be smart. It's the only way to continue to keep one another safe. Yeah, I'm not disputing how the virus spreads. I'm, I'm well aware of that. I was I was really commenting on if, if we're going to tailor legislation for our town, then it should be tailored for our town based upon the facts that we have in our town, not Alabama or Suffolk County or whatever. 
Mike, Mike, if I could add, um, so the, the graduation happened um, one week. The next week, uh, it was the 26th. The governor's order came out, sorry, the 27th uh, about quarantining. And then the 28th, there was an attempt at having a large youth party at town with many of the people who were supposed to be quarantining and you know some of them being driven up by adults. So even after that, there was an occurrence of a violation of the governor's orders. And one of my fears has been when I didn't get voluntary compliance, what kind of position am I putting my officers in? Because I didn't have a mechanism to you know, properly handle a situation like of non-compliance. And this law does help them and, and us do our job. Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair, very fair response. And you know, Mike, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, you know, to the chief's point, are just not following protocols and what they should be doing. And whether it's, you know, because they think it doesn't apply to them, or they're just think it's not, they're not going to make any people sick, or frankly, they just don't care. We're hoping that this will incentivize people that perhaps shouldn't be need to be incentivized, but we're hoping it will incentivize people more to make sure that they they do what should be done for the you know greater good and public health. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Lyle, can we take the next yeah. next caller? <laughs> the, uh, the next person is Sean Marinaris. Marinara is close. It's uh, this is Sean Marinus. How's everybody doing? Um, you know, I think the wall, the 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 law is actually pretty good. The only issue I have with it is really the um, I, I have a problem with the private residence uh, regulation. I think on the one hand, it doesn't penalize the behavior that I think we're all concerned about. For example, you know, I think you have 50 people cramped in a basement. Um, on a hot summer night is actually kind of the um, you know issue we're concerned about. But if everybody has a beer in their hand, then technically they're not violating the law, you know, um, because of the carve out. You have to make this carve out for eating and drinking. And at the same time, it would penalize you know two dads standing five feet apart pushing their kids on a swing. Um, and then I think at the same time, the, the chief mentioned the issue in terms of actually enforcing something on private property. Um, so my, my suggestion would basically just be to, to kind of leave the private property stuff out of it. I think it could cause way too much ambiguity um, than certainty. Uh, and I do think that the sort of, and Jeremy, I would use the term cooperator, not rat. Uh, <laughs> but I think that the, um, the, the, there is an issue of tattling on neighbors. I think anybody who's sort of been paying attention to the, uh, you know, Chappaqua Facebook blog, uh, you know, mama sphere. Um, sees that it's really turning into to quite a nightmare. And this is a true story. I do know somebody who had somebody basically come onto their property, traipse through their backyard and start taking pictures of people, of actually construction workers in their backyard. You know, that's something that I did hear from a close uh, friend. So that's my suggestion, you know, take, take it or leave it. Just the, um, that the private residential uh, enforcement, I think creates uh, more issues than it solves. I just wanna quickly address the first half of your comment with regard to the exemption for eating and drinking. Um, we actually spe specify within that exemption that it only pertains to people who are seated and actively eating or drinking. That actually um, mirrors what the governor has discussed in his executive orders with regard to, uh, to mask wearing in, in restaurants. So, you know, it's not if you're holding a red solo cup and you're in someone's basement or backyard, that does not qualify. It's really meant to be an exemption for people who are um, seated at a table and, and eating or drinking. So, Dawn, to follow up to that, even you and I have a similar hats in terms of our background. Um, you know, you and I both know, based on being prosecutors, the police aren't on a violation coming into the house and forcing themselves into a house. I think the way that I, at least I look at it is if they are invited or there is a public, or pardon me, a private place, if there can be an infraction, I've used it regularly for minor in possession, for example, uh, and they also are in social distancing and not wearing masks, should not, shouldn't the police be able to issue a citation for that as well? I do think practically there's gonna be very limited um, private property enforcement for, for that very reason, because the police can't just come onto the property. Uh, and I do think, unfortunately, there may be occasions, I don't, you know, I think Matt, uh, Mike, I'm part of me, said it before, and you're saying it now about concerns. Um, at some point, you know, someone's going to make a phone call or take pictures, 
they are they going to go the distance and the, are the police going to go then to the to law to the judge and take the next step to get out remove the hearsay element um you know i think we'll have to deal with that as it comes but hopefully that it's not going to be as grave a situation as you describe and if it is then we can circle back for lack of a better term but i, I don't think it'll rise to that level the, yeah, no, I, I, I agree that I think that in reality, it's sort of going to be a non-issue in terms of the actual enforcement of private infractions. My concern is really, I think, just what I've seen in terms of neighbors sort of, you know, tattling on, on neighbors and pictures and, and sort of people, you know, talking, uh, you know, trying to call. I don't think that there's actually going to be a, uh, you know, complaint filed and it's going to go the distance or anything like that. I think that, you know, the people in town are, or the, the people running the town are rational. I, I, I am concerned just about uh, that this is going to basically give people with nothing better to do, um, you know, an opportunity to spin their wheels and try to sort of take pictures and, and talk behind their neighbors' backs and all that kind of stuff. That, that's really my concern, not that, you know, people are really going to be hauled into court about this. And Sean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, and, and Sean, I also just want to point out, it, it, besides residential property, this also addresses the issues in the businesses with the merchants. I was on a conference call with merchants last week and one of the business owner, one of the merchants had said that a woman came into her store, she was wearing her mask, took her mask off, sat down on the couch and started chit chatting on her cell phone. And those are really awkward situations where a store owner who has been closed for four months will then now have to confront the customer. Whereas once we apply this, this local law, it makes that conversation so much smoother and certainly much more um, clearer to, to the folks who are shopping in town. So I, I just, I, I, I also just want you to, to everyone to consider what situations our business owners are in, as well as the folks at the library. They sent a, a letter of support for this local law because the staff has also experienced folks coming into the library with masks. And when we pull the rug under, from underneath people to, to not be able to address these issues, it, it makes everything so difficult in a climate that's already so difficult. Um, so I, I just want everyone to, to recognize that as well. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Sean. And Sean, of course, thank you too. Okay, next person up is Barry Zizi. Welcome back, Barry. Barry, take your phone off mute or your computer off mute. Should we should we put him back in the, the queue and he'll realize it? I oh, there. think so. Oh, oh, there, he oh there he is. Oh, he's on, he's on. Ed Barry, we can hear you. Barry? Barry, we think we should be able to hear you. We're not seeing the uh, the mute on for your line, but we're not hearing you if you are speaking. All right, Barry, you're gonna have to uh, work on your computer a bit. Uh, come back in and raise your hand. Let's move on to the next person. Sorry. Uh, next person is Jim McCauley. Jim McCauley, sorry. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. There you go. Hi, I just unmuted Welcome. it. Uh, I would say good to see you all, but uh, maybe not under the circumstances. All the way around. Um, listen, I have some problems with this. Um, on one level, uh, just, you know, this morning's paper, local paper, had, uh, uh, the county executive saying we had, I think it was zero cases yesterday, that our cluster has seemed to, be, to end at 27. And it just seems like overkill. And, you know, training the barn door after the horses are out. How, now, I understand <clears throat> some problems like uh, Lauren just mentioned, uh, other people mentioned some situations where there are people who don't follow it. <clears throat> but I think 
if you narrow the law to uh, specifically allow all this, you know, any commercial spot to bar people who are not complying. You know, I don't want to go in the store and whether it be Walgreens or Langs or whatever, I, I don't, I wear the mask, I put it on and I prefer everyone, you know, would do it. Um, certainly that <clears throat> would seem uh, less draconian and uh, get the message across, you know, maybe a, one or two fines of a couple hundred dollars would get the message across. Uh, additionally, I also have a major problem with the pr private property piece. Um, I live in a condo. Um, people are close together. There are, I think, 700 other condos in, in Newcastle. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there, there could be issues that uh, I don't think we want uh, the police department involved in. Um, and some of them may be, you know, in some cases, just like was just mentioned, they may be valid. Um, but if people get in their car and don't have it on and they're alone, should we be spending, you know, municipal resources on that issue, even the phone calls? So I'd, I'd like you to reconsider it and um, uh, bring it down, so to speak, narrow it down. Um, I don't see any need for us to be first in any regard. I think that's, again, the carts out of the, you know, the horses out of the barn. Um, and it kind of looks very reactionary as opposed to proact, you know, proactive. Um, and I've, you know, I, I've known people who had the disease, I've known people who've died from it. So I'm not saying this out of, uh, you know, complete, uh, you know, remove from the situation. Okay, thank you. I just want to comment. I, I appreciate your comment. You know, you gave a great analogy or, or you said you don't want to chain the barn door if the horses are out. I would argue that that the herd is out there and they're going to stampede in and we're chaining the, the, the prophylactically actually chaining the barn door so they don't all come in because even if we're safe now, eventually people are going to go back to the city's, city to work. Eventually people are going to get on the subways and the train. I mean, I haven't been in since March 11th. Am I going to drive in when I start going every day? I can't afford to drive and park every single day in the city. Um, so, you know, am I going to be exposed? Maybe I probably will be at some point. So I look at it a little bit differently. And, and when I say the, prophylactically, if we're safe or safe now, it's going to come back. Um, it's not gone. The herd's still out there. So that, that's my thought. I, I understand your, your view on it. And, and again, with the private property, I understand that as well. And it's a good point with the condominiums that, that uh, is a valid issue. But I, I look at it a little differently. I, I do think it's not reactionary. I think it's prophylactically. And the hope is that other communities see this as an example. And, uh, and then we get some more direction from the state to, to regulate as they deem fit. And I, I would just add to that, you know, I think um, dodged a bullet is an unfortunate, unfortunate expression in this circumstance, but, you know, we were fortunate insofar as the, the contact tracing program did its job. And so we were able to shut down this virus and then the transmission of it at only 27 cases. And we were fortunate insofar as that none of the individuals who contracted the virus wound up in the hospital or, you know, worse. Um, and, and, you know, we got lucky. Um, and on the other hand, everybody is going off for summer vacation right now. And the virus still exists. It exists in this community. Um, as we were hearing earlier, I mean, there are asymptomatic carriers who are absolutely still in our community. And so I think what we want to be able to do with this local law is not simply react to the graduation event and the, the related events that happened now three weeks ago, um, but to prepare ourselves and to have the tools in our tool shed to be able to turn on a dime if anything were to happen again. So, you know, when the chief is getting reports, the night after the governor has issued his directive that folks must quarantine, when he is getting a report that there is a house party happening, we want him to be able to have the tools in his toolbox to react to that. Um, and we want to deliver a message to our community that we've told everyone that 
they must wear masks. We've told everyone that they must social distance. If we're not getting the voluntary compliance, our community is prepared to act and we are prepared to lead. And so, you know, some people speculated that the governor made an example of this community. And that may be true. He may have made an example of our community. It really could have happened every, anywhere, but it didn't happen anywhere. It happened here. And we're absolutely going to be leaders. We're not going to be bystanders. We're going to take a proactive position. And so I believe that's what we've done here is that we've taken a proactive as opposed to a reactive position with regard to this local law. Okay, next I'll try Barry again, see if he's available. Barry, have you been able to unmute yourself? Just give it a shot. I guess not. So I'm going to go on to uh, Michael Weinberg. Yeah, you know what? Just before we move on, can I just make a recommendation, Barry? If you want to email uh, townboard at mynewcastle.org, one of us can jump onto our email, pull off your issue, and we can read it out loud on this call. Thanks, uh, uh, Michael? Hi. Uh, Mike Weinberg from Chappaqua. I guess I qualify for long time call. Um, so uh, I am uh, uh, just uh, standing up to ask for support for this uh, bill, uh, the law. Uh, I think it's appropriate. I think we've certainly had uh, enough issues, uh, not just here, but around the state and around the country. I don't see what the problem is. All we're doing is enforcing the governor's executive order. Um, and uh, uh, I sit on the board of the uh, Chamber of Commerce here locally, and we have not heard any complaints or issues from coming from them, although I'm speaking only for myself today. And so uh, I would encourage you to pass the bill. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Next, Next is, is Scott Morrison. Uh, hi, Scott Morrison, also in Chappaqua. Um, just three quick points. One is I understand uh, that local municipalities should have the ability to put forward local laws. Uh, for example, I think Newcastle was one of the first in the area to have the, the, the plastic bag uh, ban, which, which is great. Um, but in this case, this is something that affects all of us equally, not only across New York State, but frankly, around the world. My concern is that if we come up with the enforcement mechanisms in Newcastle, uh, Mount Pleasant could have a different set of enforcement mechanisms. And then you have a different set in Mount Kisco and, and you know, elsewhere and you get into the cities and suddenly it becomes a, a, a real challenge just for people to understand what the enforcement is. So I, I would ask the town to consider that and maybe just quickly start the dialogue to make sure that if we do this, that there is going to be some consistency. So that's my first point. Um, second, um, I, I really applaud what we heard from uh, Regeneron. I think you know it, it all makes sense and we should be wearing the masks and so forth. But what I've always been concerned about is you know, what happens when you take it off for eating and drinking um, and, and for exercise. And this is written into the law. And you know, what happens when you accidentally sneeze or cough when you're doing that? And um, Again, my concern is that it's in, you know, it's written into this, and that's probably the time when we are going to catch it because of that. And then the last thing is I'd like to echo what some others have said, and I disagree with the private property aspect of this law, and I think that that should be removed. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to just respond. I think you're correct um, um, about uh, the different um, Enforcement issues, you know, if, if, for example, Mount Pleasant and then uh, Mount Kisco have, uh, have their own enforcement mechanism. But that's why I think that the dialogue has to start. And I don't think it starts just by talking. I think there has to be doing. Um, and I think, again, we were the catalyst to get the Department of Health on the state level to do something. And hopefully, probably not from the county, 
I, I think that's too small of a scale, just like Newcastle's too small of a scale, that New York State does something, then maybe with that sort of trifecta of Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, they do something collectively. So I think that has to start somewhere. Um, and then in terms of, I think we all recognize it's imperfect, um, especially the piece with you mentioned about uh, uh, eating and drinking and exercising. And part of me, I'm looking down at some of my notes I took. That is sort of mimicking what the governor already has. And the governors can't, and I think we'd all object if everything was legislated against. You would stop every business. You would stop every interaction. So at some point, he has to sort of pick between the, the best or the worst to say, this is okay, this is permissible. So we're really just mimicking that. But I think your point is spot on. It just, you know, you're stopping it here, but you're allowing it here. We're just minimizing it as best we can, and we're adhering to what the governor has already done. Maybe he should expand it, maybe he shouldn't, but we're adhering to that. In terms of the private property, uh, you know, we've discussed that issue, and I understand that position as well. Thank you, Scott. I see at least one more hand up right now. Yeah, we have uh, Sunny. Here is Sonny. Uh, I need to take you off mute. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's quite interesting to participate in discussion of this draft law. And uh, our general um, opinion is that we do not need this law, especially in this community where people are law abiding and they know what they're doing. But if the tendency is that this law should be adopted, then we have a couple of points to be made. Uh, one of them is the respiratory droplets. When exactly do they occur? If a person is not talking to any people he, he or she is meeting while in the park, then it's not necessary for that person to wear the mask. If I just go there to have fresh air and somebody complains that I'm just walking there without the mask. But my point was just to go there and to have some fresh air. So I'm afraid of abuses like this, that some people will be complaining. And I had such situations when I would go to the Hudson just to have some fresh air and to walk along uh, the river. And I would be listening to some podcasts, but somebody would come to me and say, why are you not wearing a mask? But I'm not even opening my mouth. So these abuses, um, unfortunately quite possible to occur. And um, so this also relates to the enforcement mechanism because as several people, several citizens mentioned, we don't want uh, for neighbors to tell, tell on each other and to, to report each other for when they do not know what exactly is happening. And if we allow people to actively eat at the restaurants without masks, it can be also actively eating in the in your backyard. So it's the same situation. If it can spread at the restaurant, as somebody mentioned already, it can the same way, like if it can spread in the backyard, then it can spread at the restaurant as well. So it's not exactly so good. And the penalty in general, the fine, it's not a good measure. Again, considering the composition of this neighborhood, and um, as you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the meeting, uh, when the, uh, it was discovered that during the graduation, the some people were infected with the virus, many families, or most of them voluntarily, you mentioned 300 people, they agreed to quarantine themselves. And that's what most of the people are doing. If they go somewhere with the family for vacation, they know, they read enough that they should quarantine themselves. They even try to sign out of the camp, which they have reserved the seat for because they know they're going for vacation and they would rather stay at home. So it's like, why don't we trust our own reason and the reasonability of each individual who is living in this town? I just wanted to address the, the first part of your comment, Sunny, and thank you for, for sharing your experience. Just with regard to the respiratory droplets, the, the issue with respiratory droplets, and, and we heard this earlier um, from one of our, our speakers, is that uh, the, the droplets are, are formed from breathing itself. That's why you feel the, the humidity and the moisture inside of the mask. Um, but with regard to sort of you're taking a walk and you're at 
Gedney Park and you're around the pond or you're in Whippoorwill next to the stream or, or wherever you like to go to, to um, sort of take your walks. As long as you're maintaining your social distance, that six feet of space, you're okay. You don't have to be wearing the mask when you can maintain social distancing. It's only when you come within close contact with somebody, so you're passing by them on the trail, have that mask with you to then be able to slip it on when you're walking past somebody. So that's that's what we're, we're trying to address here. Um, but if you look at CDC rules, then they, and I sent it by email, you have that snapshot they um, describe it as, uh, just a second, let me read it. Basically, the mask is necessary for the source control and source control happens when a person is coughing, sneezing, talking or raising their voice. So they're recommending the mask for those particular things. They do not mention in CDC, I checked it today and that Snapchat snapshot is um, timed at 2.14. So that's what they have at CDC. Basically, if you're just breathing, breathing around, nothing comes out. There are no fluids, there are no droplets until you start talking. As for the other thing about walking and just having a mask nearby, uh, sometimes you just come to the places, for example, if you're on a trail around the town, they are sometimes more narrow than allowing you to be at a distance of six feet. So do you have to jump to your mask and like uh, put it on? Because it, we yes. don't want to be paranoid of each other. Yes. We're still people. But, but, we but, we're, but what we're doing here is not actually creating new policy, right? All we're doing, again, is giving the enforcement mechanism to our police department for them to be able to enforce that which is already spelled out in the governor's executive orders. And that executive order 202.17 does say, does mandate that you must wear a face mask when you're unable to socially- But distance. again, if you're not talking during that moment- It doesn't, it doesn't specify person. whether you're talking or not talking. That, but if you that look at executive CDC order rules, is quite clear rules, you must wear your mask. It. You should take a look at CDC rule, how they um, defined respiratory droplets and when they occur. Okay, thank you for that thank you comment. Very much. I, I do appreciate that. I just want to add one last thing about that. You know, certainly we're following the governor's executive order. We're adhering to the best practices from the governor. Uh, and I wish we could all say that if we were just talking or not talking, that we wouldn't sneeze or cough or yell or something would happen. Uh, we don't know when those things happen. Uh, it just, just happens. But nonetheless, we're following established executive order. We're not creating anything new when you're walking on trails. In fact, when I walk around, I carry mine with me if I can social distance. But thank you, Sonny, thank you very much for your, your call in. Okay, next we have Margaret Machetto. Hello all. I don't know we if you can, can hear you. Okay, welcome, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I uh, just wanted to, um, first of all, tell Christina, when you hold up the time sign, it's backwards. So you need to write it the other way. It says emit. Um, but uh, I just wanted to um, uh, give a shout out to Lori Morton, who not only took time tonight, but has been so good. That's perfect, Christina. <laughs> um, in, in answering so many community questions and I support her and Regeneron and definitely support Chief Carroll. I just wanted to echo the concerns that have been raised by Sean and um, a couple of other people, uh, Jim McCauley, that I would like the board to consider tailoring the proposed law to uh, exclude uh, private property. And I know that you're looking to, um, you were talking about uh, looking at the governor's executive order um, and you know uh, about gatherings over a certain size. So I didn't know if it was possible to consider um, the tailoring of if you keep private property in, could it be um, you know with a designation of uh, gatherings of a certain size? So it wasn't like a, a family of six people, like I mean extended family um, that you didn't need to, uh, feel uncomfortable in your in your own home, and and also if you choose to keep the law the way it's written, I know Chief Carroll has 
um, said extensively tonight that they will uh, certainly be mindful about their enforcement, but um, I would just like to, to highlight that uh, aspect of it, um, of that on private property, that it be considered for larger gatherings, not for, um, you know, two families getting together to have dinner. My brother lives in Pleasantville. He's been at my house. Um, we're a large Irish Catholic family, so we uh, might be our own gathering anyway, but I, I really feel uncomfortable um, with regulations coming on private property. Thank you. So um, Peggy, so, you know, I've had that too, where I've had, you know, my sister and family come over, but we make sure that we're, we, we are social distancing and they're on one side of a table and we are all the way on the other side so we can be together while still being apart. I think, you know, that the size of the gathering is not the same as the mask issue because yes, you can have more than a certain number of people, but you know, even if you have 10 people and you know, one has COVID and their friends hanging out and they're all together, you're gonna have an issue which then, you know, as we saw can spread much larger and to different even communities. So I think that's sort of where the issue is that, you know, people are having house parties. We wanna be able to enforce that. If you are sitting on opposite sides of the table with your extended family, that's not going to fall under this because you're social distancing. It's really when you're not. I know it doesn't fall under it, but it has to do with feeling comfortable on your own property. And you know, if my niece happens to come within four feet, um, you know, even accidentally, and I, I, I don't think you know, all of us are talking about extreme circumstances of the very few people who are not trying their best. But when it comes to adding a regulation to the books, I think it should be as tailored as possible from you know, just a, a general philosophical point of view. Um, and, and that's what I would like to see the board think about. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> You know, I was just wondering, I don't know if you have the answer, Chief. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I was curious, how many house parties have you broken up, if you know, over a year, in any, any given year? The reason why I say that is because to think, and I can appreciate what you just said, and she's off now, but um, uh, to think that we have the, the, the police power, and that's the top priority that we're going to be cruising the streets and the neighborhoods, again, if you're three people or 50, up to 50 people, you still have to social distance or wear the mask. Uh, that doesn't change. Granted, the location is different in terms of the home, uh, or in terms of our enforcement. But you know, I, to think that the police are going to just come and break up families from not social distancing just doesn't seem practical. So I don't know if you have that answer. How many house parties you broke up? You know that that went undetected, where kids were drinking, or parents or adults were having noisy parties and you know, violated a noise violation. I, I can't imagine it's an everyday event. I would say that 90% of them are reported by a neighbor, whether it for be, um, you know, uh, underage or uh, a violation of noise ordinance. And it goes in spurts, you know, so one year is different than another. Um, but the bigger issue is when it actually is um, a youth party. This year, you know, it was quiet until, you know, right around graduation time where people, I think, started to loosen up and, you know, felt a sense that they, you know, it was over and they could just, you know, do what they wanted to do. And, and you know, we have had to deal with a couple of parties after that point. So, and yes, if you're in your house with your, you know, your niece and she's four feet away from you, there's no way we're gonna know or looking to enforcement. If you're in your backyard having a private family party, are, are we gonna see it or is your neighbor gonna call? And I don't think that's gonna happen. And if the, in a case like that, I would certainly hope we can use discretion and again, voluntary, voluntary compliance. Sorry about the dog. Just like you do with the speeding ticket, I think that's a fair analogy. There's people who get tickets, there's people who don't. You have a discretion to allow them to go with a warning. I, I think you've also said it before, Jeremy. It's like a noise ordinance complaint, right? I mean, how many times do we get a call from somebody mowing their lawn early, and um, you know they're in the backyard, but we we see the violation of the noise ordinance. So do we, do we address it? Yes. Most of the time, is it a warning? Yes. If it's a repeat offender, will we issue a summons? We certainly would. Thank you, Chief. I actually have Barry's questions uh, that came through over email just now. Um, so okay. 
I will, uh, I I will read them out loud. Come in in case he wants to talk. Barry, you want to take yourself off mute? I think he, he, his email says he's having some trouble. He's unable to unmute, but he can hear us. Yeah, okay. So let me go ahead and I'll read through the questions real quick. My questions are as follows. Number one, I've asked numerous times, how many people on the sustainability board? Oh, wait a second. These are questions about leaf blowers. So Barry, I, I'm, I'm looking through your questions right now. Apologize for not reading them through before I started reading them out loud. Um, but I think all of these questions pertain to, pertain to the leaf blower. So I'm, I'm actually, we're gonna hold those um, because we have another public hearing coming up and we can read these into the record at that public hearing. So that said, I do not see any other, um, sorry, I do not see any other um, comments right now. Oh, and literally, as I said that, we got two more. I guess we should let Eric in since he hasn't spoken before. Yep. Eric, take yourself off mute. Okay. We hear you. Okay, good enough. Um, number one, I'm inclined to think those fees are a little bit draconian, although I'm aware of the fact that judges can reduce that, but I think you should go with lower figures. Uh, the other question is, you mentioned the question of the um, enforcement from the situation that occurred at the graduation. Um, as a result of that, I took my uh, took one of the tests. It took me 12 days to get a re, re answer back from the county. Uh, with that kind of delay, I'm not sure what influence we have. But unfortunately, had I had the situation where I was infected, I would have uh, shown the characteristics long before I got the test results back. Um, the county is sending out notices that they'll do it within three days, uh, but they're, at least in my case, they are far from meeting that goal. Uh, so I think it's something we should be commenting to the county if other people are experiencing the same situation. Um, the other question is in terms of um, people getting together, neighbors, etc. cetera. Um, as I understand it, if the neighbors are getting together for a barbecue, but they are wearing masks, uh, and doing social uh, separation, even though you're going on private property, that is allowed. Am I not correct? Correct. Okay. Okay, Eric, thank you for those questions. I actually, you know, maybe I'll follow up with you offline tomorrow because I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about your experience and, and how long it took to get the, the test results back. That's certainly something we could follow up with the county about. Um, if you were tested at a county facility. Um, Jill and I will, uh, we're, we're exchanging eyes over Zoom right now. We'll follow up tomorrow. <laughs> okay, Jim McCauley's back. One more comment. If you do pass it, I'd also like to see a sunset provision in it. 30 days after the COVID, uh, you know, problem is over or 90 days, some, some reasonable period, 30, 60, 90. In so the, that- um, The local law only pertains to when we're in a local state of emergency. All right. All right, so that it can't be used uh, nope. down the road or mis, you know, in, reinterpreted, misinterpreted, whatever. All right. Absolutely, agree. <laughs> okay. That's all, thank you. Thank you. So do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Did, Did we the board want to vote? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, was the board interested in voting on this this evening? Yes. Okay, I'd like to do a roll call vote on that. Can we actually read the resolution first and, and get a second on that and then we'll do the roll call vote? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Did you want me to read it or someone else? 
Who has it in front of them? Does do one of the town board members have it? Everybody's flipping between multiple screens. <laughs> I've got it. I'm, can I go? Yes. Okay. I move to adopt a local law to create chapter 86 requiring the use of face masks and face coverings to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Okay. Okay, so Christina's going to do a roll call vote, which is we're going to use that this evening so that we have the ability to um, properly record each town board member's vote um, and for each board member to be able to uh, address any of the comments that you heard tonight and to speak to your vote should you wish to. Okay. Supervisor Poole? Aye. Deputy Supervisor Salam? Uh, I'd, yes, I'd like to explain my vote first. Um, you know, whether the President of the United States, Governor of New York, Westchester County Executive, or, or Council person on this board, you know, it's your duty to advocate and protect the public that we serve. Am I, am I on mute? No. Nope, you're I'm good. Right. Um, uh, well, you know, some issues are manageable and easy to navigate. You know, it's a flat linear path. And there's others like COVID-19 that are, are much more rugged and a steep climb. Uh, there's decisions we have to get to, and these decisions are, are not always easy, uh, but they're based on the available information that we have, and we do what we believe is right for the well-being and the public health of our community. Um, and over the past few months, we have seen um, you know, numerous leaders, uh, chief executives here in New York, Governor Cuomo and George Latimer, who have guided us really through this forest, through this darkness, to a better place, and there's others that have left us stranded with neither, you know, a compass nor a map. So now that the new Newcastle Town Board is in this position to do something, we are making our best efforts to make sure that the community is safe with the information that we have, acknowledging fully that there is nothing perfect, acknowledging fully that there are concerns that people have over private property rights and what that means. Um, I, I can all appreciate as well that when we have a, a legislation here that requires uh, enforcement or allows for enforcement, pardon me, and then there's other municipalities that don't, we don't want it to have a patchwork of information or patchwork of legislation. And it's our hope, I believe, when I speak for the board, that something more fluid and equal across the board will come from the state eventually and work its way down. Um, you know, I think, let me take that back. I'm proud of the effort and the work of the town board of, of Jill Shapiro, and Nick Ward Willis at Keenan Bean. Everyone has really put their heart into this to figure out what is best, even if there are those who don't think that it's best. And I can appreciate that people disagree, but I'll keep on going back to it. I will err on the side of caution. I will do, and I say, I think the town board as a whole will do what we think is right to maintain the public health and the collective safety and welfare of this community. Um, I don't need to go through everything other than just saying, again, I remind people it's up to $250. It doesn't mean you're gonna get it, a fine. The police have discretion. Uh, the police have to see what happens. Uh, this isn't a criminal offense. And frankly, we don't want the police to do the alternative if they have to. Um, you know, None of us on this town board and none of us in any volunteer group uh, foresaw what was gonna happen with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, certainly any one of us who were here on the town board didn't join the town board and put ourselves out there just to make sure that the plantings were pretty along the street, that our playground was nice, that our hamlets are, hamlets are beautified. And for that matter, you know, you know we're not ecstatic, uh, uh, obsessive about zoning. We, you know, these are all pieces of the puzzle, but you, know, you don't just do it for the easy lift. And we are taking that this difficult position and, and trying to do the right thing. And I'm hopeful and I'm confident that Local, other local municipalities and state government will continue to listen to their residents and their constituents in our community. And I'm proud that we're leading the way. And I think that this is the change that's coming to best ensure that we are safe here and well beyond. So after all of that, I, I vote in support uh, of this legislation. Thank you for your vote. Um, Council Member Katz, how do you vote? Um, so just really quickly, I just wanted to say too, uh, not quite as long as Jeremy. Um, I, uh, 
normally I don't love voting um, on the same day we have a public hearing because I don't want people to think that we're not considering all of your very valuable points. Um, but I have thought about this for a long time and the points you brought up are very valid. And they're also points that I, and I know other members of the board have considered beforehand as well. Uh, so that's why I am voting tonight and I'm voting for this I, uh, because I just think that the public policy behind this is so important that even given, you know, some of the worry about, you know, overstepping maybe on private property. I think that the public policy purpose of this is, is way too important to let this go past tonight. So I'm voting for this. Thank you. Council member Levin. Um, I'd first like to say, um, you know, I really, really appreciate everyone's time coming tonight. I know it takes a lot of effort and um, time to just come here and, and vocalize your concerns as well as, you know, just even not sitting down at dinner with your family and coming on here. I know time is really important. Um, addressing the issues as far as the nuances of the local law, I, I really want to say this unequivocally that our police department and the police department's track record as it relates to enforcing any type of law in town has a stellar record. And entrusting them in this type of law I have complete confidence, especially when the chief of police has written a letter of support for the local law. Furthermore, just in the in the in the context of philosophy, 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 philosophy <laughs> sorry, um, you know, I, I generally like I, I I don't love you know when we have laws that that make people feel uncomfortable and make people feel uneasy. But at the end of the day, if you're already doing the right thing, this law will not change your life. It really won't. And lastly, as someone who has consistently not engaged in social media that that involves a lot of anger and, and fights or infighting and as well as just a lot of um, you know divisive um, confrontations in online, I really hope that this law will create a type of culture that will encourage people to take it offline and address it with our police department as well as just providing them a space where they can call the police department and feel comfortable doing so. Um, so in, in that regard, my, my vote is aye. Thank you. And last but not least, Council Member Lichtenthal. Thanks. Lichtenthal. <laughs> um, at this time, the best way for us to confront this global pandemic is through social distancing, wearing a mask when social distancing is not possible, and good hygiene through hand washing and hand sanitizer. The ability to enforce Governor Cuomo's executive orders is needed to combat this public health issue in our town. Currently, the executive order is based on an honor system and responsible behavior. And unfortunately, too many people have shown to either be careless, not exhibit responsible behavior, or not have enough respect for their fellow neighbors. For the record, my reservations at this time are twofold. Uh, first, that this could be a deterrent for that causing people to hesitate before coming to our town to shop, which is most open for most forms of business. And secondly, does not necessarily take into account those scenarios that you would co colloquially be referred to as quarantining between individuals or between families. However, I believe the public health benefits of the executive orders and their enforcement through this proposed local law outweighs any real or perceived drawbacks. Uh, I am in support of this local law. Thank you. Okay, so we, um, seeing that we have all in favor, the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. My pleasure. So we'll, we'll get this filed immediately. Perfect. I am going to give everyone a two minute break and I mean it this time. <laughs> Guys, I have to run and use the bathroom. I apologize. We're going to give everybody a two minute break. We'll be right back and then we will open the public hearing uh, with regard to our leaf blower legislation. Thank you for your patience.
Is it shit? Should be some chairs in the garage. Oh, so we're going to be here another hour at least. I think we are ready to go. Um, our deputy supervisor, Jeremy Sland, is here, but um, decided not to treat everybody to a video of him eating his dinner. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, so we are ready to go. Can I get a motion to open the public hearing on the proposed leaf blower legislation? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So welcome everybody for the continuation of tonight's uh, town board meeting. Uh, we now have for you a public hearing. It is our first time this calendar year, but certainly not our first time discussing our proposed leaf blower legislation. Uh, we have been discussing this in work sessions with the Sustainability Advisory Board, um, who are represented here on the call tonight by Rand Manassi. Um, and we have been discussing with this with them in our work sessions uh, this year. Um, and we have made some changes to the local law from, uh, from last year. Um, although the version that we have in front of us tonight is the, uh, the same as at our last work session for those of you who've been following along. Um, and so can I actually kick it over to, I, it, it, Drew and Nick, are you guys planning on, on doing an overview of the local law or were we having Rand present tonight? I'm actually not sure who's, who's doing yeah, it. Yeah, my understanding is that Rand has prepared as he has in the past a power Point presentation, correct, Rand? And you'll sort of provide the overview? Uh, that's correct. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. And thank you for having me here tonight. And 
Uh, if you don't mind, I'll share my screen. Uh, if I have that control, while do I control the share screen? We'll see. I guess I'll just try to do it and we'll see what happens. Do you all see your presentation? Yes? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So thank you for having me tonight and I will make a uh, rather short presentation if you don't mind and fill in any questions anyone has after that. Uh, but my presentation is on the Newcastle Leaf Blower Environmental Protection Law uh, presented by the Newcastle Sustainable Advisory Board. Um, um, if it goes forward, I will make the presentation. It worked in before, there we go. Agenda, there we go, now I'm there. So my agenda will be an executive summary, which I'll show you the um, executive summary of the law itself. I'll tell you a little bit about what our neighbors, the neighbors being the municipalities around us have done in relationship to the law. Uh, I'll tell you about the how we plan on educating both of the constituents in our town uh, as well as landscapers and our rollout plan for the law if it should, should get enacted. A uh, training program that we anticipate bringing about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about current electric blower technology to try to uh, demystify a little bit about what you know, current electric blower technology looks like. And I'll give you some insight, non-scientific, what our residents are saying about uh, those that have made the transition to electric. And we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So the executive summary on the legislation, and there'll be another slide here that will give you a little bit more about it. So where did we come and how did we get here? Well, the SAB has been conducting research on leaf blowers for three plus years now. Uh, we have submitted to the town board a local law to significantly reduce the ill effects, or at least as the SAB sees it, the ill effects of using uh, fuel powered motorized leaf blowers. During these three years, we received many comments from people who thought the law didn't go far enough and those who thought it went too far. So by doing that, we've received all these comments. We opened up listening meetings over the years from various stakeholders. And we took those listening meetings and we have been working on that over these years to come up with what we think is a revised solution that fits to the majority now, uh, where fuel powered leaf blowers will be allowed to be used in town from October through May, and electric leaf blowers will be allowed to be used all year long. And I'll give that in a, in a graph in a few minutes. Uh, and the law then centers around that exemptions, and there are a few exemptions in the law, will be determined really based upon public safety concerns. We thought that'd be the best way to go about using an exemption policy in the law itself. So what does that all mean when we boil it down? And I can bring up the um, actual legislation in a few minutes if we want to see it. But what it all boils down to is this. From October 1st to May 30th, you'll be able to, anyone in town, will be able to use both fuel powered or gas leaf blowers if you want to boil it down to nomenclature that others might readily accept. Um, gas leaf blowers can be used all year round and electric leaf blowers can be used I mean, excuse me, gas leaf blowers can be used October 1st to May 31st, and electric leaf blowers can be used all, all year long. From June 1st to September 31st, which I refer to in season, uh, only electric leaf blowers will be permitted in town. Um, we also follow what has now been revised, or not revised, but we use the domestic tools noise ordinance to follow along with that of uh, motorized leaf blowers. And when I say motorized leaf blowers, I'm referring really to the greater group of both electric and fuel-based leaf blowers or gas leaf blowers. So the noise ordinance um, for domestic tools has been slightly modified because it, you know, did have the, the, it did have these same constraints, but it was a little bit vague in that it, before it, it said things like 8 a.m. to sundown. So I so in working with um, the town um, and the MP, uh, the police department, we also uh, tightened that up a little bit to be a little bit more definitive in its timelines. So now we've defined it in the ordinance to say 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. 
uh, 8, 8, uh, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturdays and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sundays and holidays would be the times that you would be able to use motorized leaf blowers. Uh, all the times you'd be able to use any uh, leaf blow, or you'd be, a, be able to use motorized uh, devices that do not exceed 45 dBAs. Uh, and that would be able to allow people in town to be able to uh, work in or to be able to have um, the peace that they would need because 45 dBA is a level that is, is um, restrictive enough to, that you can uh, enjoy your peace of having you know, dinner in the backyard. I know it's a late hour for dinner, but also be able to enjoy your, your evenings and, and, and the like. So when we get to exemptions, what does exemptions mean? Exemptions really come down to the uh, Chappaqua Central School District and the town's recreational fields and tennis courts, country clubs, homeowners associations, swim clubs, golf courses. Um, well, let me just leave, let me stop before I get to golf courses to say it's the country clubs, homeowners associations, swim clubs, uh, the tennis courts. So it's the tennis courts that are being defined for those. And then we include golf courses and cemeteries. Those would be what's exempt. Um, so the exemptions really look at large areas where public safety might be of a concern. Though that's what's exempt. So exemptions really are around public safety. Um, and even in there, we do ask that these organizations um, try to minimize the extent, the use of any fuel powered motorized leaf blower to the minimal extent that they can. Um, and we do make one other exemption that the town administrator may temporarily permit the use of a fuel powered leaf blower uh, where necessary for public safety, safety concerns. Um, so again, as I said before, we wanna align all of this with the noise ordinance for domestic tools. So that's the executive summary when it comes to what the, the ordinance that we're proposing comes down to. Uh, I'm going to stop at this point and ask the board if they have any questions along these lines, because uh, we can then move on to some of the, some of the other uh, parts of, of the presentation about rollout, et cetera. Anyone from the board? No? Okay, then let me move on. So what do our neighbors do? So this aligns very much with the other municipalities in town. And the SAB, to make sure that we weren't going off in the a tangent that didn't make sense. We did contact many of the other municipalities in Westchester County, and we did find that most of them did wrestle with these same concerns that we've been wrestling with over the past three years and finding a balance that made sense. And although over half of them exempted their towns from the ban, as we have had to do, many of them stated that they tried to set a good example. Why did they exempt? For the same reason that we did, public safety concerns. But even though they exempted themselves, hear what most of them said. We've asked our landscapers, uh, landscape contractors to switch to electric. So even though that they could use uh, gas leaf gas leaf blowers or fuel powered uh, leaf, leaf blowers, they did ask their landscapers to try to switch to electric. We're, or they said we're taking uh, to using alternative measures such as mulching, vacuuming where practical. Or our town supervisor has just town supervisor has discouraged their use. So even though that they were able to, to use them, they were finding that most of the supervisors, as in our own town administrator, has tried to minimize the use of uh, gas leaf blowers wherever possible. Um, we think that is admirable, and that is what we're actually trying to do in our own town. Examples of what some other towns have been doing. Here's a... Um, brochure um, that was came out from the town of the Maronick, where they posted violations for what uh, for anything in June, July, August, and September. On the right hand side is Yonkers poster as well. Just some examples. Bedford town to our north last year post uh, came up with their own ordinance. And I think what's circled on the right is two things that you might want to take a look at. Um, was the town plan to do to help people who want to obtain good quality effective um, leaf blowers at a reasonable uh, cost? Well, they came up with a program, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when we get further on in the presentation. But they came up with a program with both Sustainable Westchester and a group called the American Green Zone Alliance to find discount programs to help the 
constituents in town in the landscape to find trade and build ramps. Uh, and the other one that circled there said, will it cost more if I'm allowed, not allowed to use a leaf blower on my property? The leaf blower laws have been implemented in more than 107 municipalities around the nation. The town of Mountain as, as an example, has had it in place since 1995. We have not heard of any municipality reporting an increase in cost. Landscapers with whom we have spoken, who worked in Westchester, where legislation has been passed, are not changing their rates. Um, again, not scientific, but this is what Bedford has found in their own uh, implementation of their laws. So if we do get this passed, wouldn't we hope that we do, how will we implement it? Well, we plan on an education and rollout, and our goals are this. We're going to inform res residents and landscapers about the law. We'll raise awareness through noise, through the noise, health, and other issues that leaf blowers cause. And we'll educate leaf blower through the leaf blower impact and alternative solutions. How will we do that? Well, some of the actions that we're anticipating will be a residential mailings and follow-ups. We'll go through the town e-newsletter. We'll post signs. We'll provide small lawn signs as we have done in the past with uh, the bad law, the uh, reusable bad law on the right. We'll do some seminar programs with healthy yard practices. We we'll partner up with the Healthy Yards Group, the Pollinator Pathways, the CNC Conservation Board. Uh, we'll do equipment demonstrations. We've done one as we were preparing for all this a couple of years ago. We'll maintain online resources. We'll hope we use the town website and we use additional resources through our own website and Facebook pages. Some examples from other towns, you saw a few before, here's some more examples uh, from other different towns. Um, I believe these are from Yonkers, um, some signs that they used in their postings. Training programs, as I mentioned before, the American Green Zone Alliance, AGSA, um, we can work with them and we have been in contact with Dan Mabe He's more than happy to work with us and to support a program. Um, town involvement is uh, crucial, though, for his involvement as well. Um, so we can, though, we can develop a training program. Uh, Sustainable Westchester is also very interested in working with us on a countywide training program. Rand, can you say something about what you mean yeah, by training? Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. I'm sorry. Can you just explain what you mean in a little more detail about the trading program? What does that consist of? Trade, typically, trading programs with AGSR have been uh, co-sponsored with some funding through the local towns. Um, so the, the way that AGSR has done them is that they have found some local funds within the town itself to help sponsor the programs. Um, they, they, you know, the... Um, Manufacturers are more willing to, to come up with some money, but they want some uh, co-funding. And either the town does it, or we need, need to find some local beneficiaries to help. Thank you. Hey, Ren, one more thing. Uh, on yeah. your prior slide, in terms of ways you're looking to uh, communicate, uh, mm -hmm. would you think it's possible for, uh, maybe it was two slides ago, there we go. Um, would it be possible for someone to email either the SAB or the town or something along those lines um, with the name and email address of their landscaper so that either the town or SAB can go and uh, notify that landscaper of, you know, here's the, uh, you know, here's the uh, pre-written notice of how this is going to work. So similar to the way we're doing it in residential mailings and so forth to be able to email um, you know, exit, you know, landscapers who are working for people in our town. Maybe for some people, it may be an awkward conversation for them to have with their landscaper, but they'd be able to let someone know who can, you know, an uh, official from our town, whether the SAB or, the, or, um, or, or someone else. Most definitely. We, we see the education program to be twofold. One of them is for the homeowners, the other one's for the landscapers. And we would love to be able to draw the landscapers in. Um, not, not the easiest thing to do by us reaching out to them. So if the residents can bring them to us, it will be a much easier task for us in the long run. Sounds good. Anything else? Anybody? No? Let me move on now. So 
one of the other big questions that's, that's been with us for the last three years, and I guess the, the three year development of this program has helped us in this last regard, and, and where's the technology come over three years? And as I sat here uh, two years ago and made these presentations, there was always a question of where's the technology, and maybe if we just waited a little while, the technology would catch up with where we want. Well, I think we can safely say that the technology is catching up. I'm not sure it's it's fully there to catch up with the gas blowers. Otherwise, I would say, let's just get rid of gas blowers year round. But I think we're pretty close there now. Um, so here's a sampling, and it's really just a sampling, non-scientific, um, but it's a sampling of where we are today. And there's two key things, to, or maybe three things to look at on these slides. Um, and the three things are the CFM, which is the cubic feet per meter, I believe it is. Um, and that's one force that a, a blower puts out, and the other one is miles per hour, MPH. Um, some people believe in CFM, some people believe in MPH um, as the, the force of the blower. Uh, and then I guess some people believe in the, the cost of the blower, so you get the third figure that you're looking at here. So the first one that you see is 155 C CFM and 160 miles per hour. Um, that's pretty much where these have been in the past, um, but it's an inexpensive blower. It's 35 to $50. Um, and if you were to look at that, that's pretty much a, a low end residential type blower. Um, it probably would work for, for my house where I don't have to blow that much. Um, easy job to do. Um, but if I'm looking for a high powered one, I'm just gonna to shift to the next page. I can come back to the first one. If you look at the one on the very bottom there, it's 340 CFM at 185 miles per hour. I would match that up with almost any uh, gas leaf blower that's out there. Most of them run about 400 CFM and they're running about 150 to 200 miles per hour. And that's a pretty much a commercial grade. That one runs up to uh, an hour on one battery charge. Uh, you know, I would match that up to most of the commercial ones that are out there, commercial backpack type blowers that are out there. You can see the one above it is 500 CFM at 125 miles per hour. The one above it as well is 500 CFM at 125. They're all running about an hour on a charge. I'm going to go back to the first page. And you could just look through all of these. The prices of these are 100 and, you know, 180 $200 each. They're all at that range now of power. Um, and the thing that you have to note here is that they're not using gas. Uh, they're not using oil. They're not, the maintenance on these are much less expensive than you would for a gas powered blower. Uh, yes, you do need to charge them. You would probably need multiple batteries on, on a truck if you were a commercial landscaper. Um, I know the, my landscaper that I use now um, does have multiple batteries that he carries on his truck and he does use electric blowers when he does use blowers. Um, but they are getting to the point where you can use these blowers in a commercial environment uh, during the summer months. Am I suggesting that he does his spring and fall cleanups with them? Not yet, but he's getting there. Um, so um, the current electric blower technology is coming up to the point where um, two, three years from now, we might be coming back and saying, you know, maybe it's time to, to ban motorized leap blowers totally, but I'm not suggesting that we, that the legislation talk to that at this point. Finally, what are our residents saying? Well, there wasn't uh, that much feedback coming in pre this public hearing, but if when I took a look at all the feedback that came in, um, it was in favor of the legislation being passed. We had six in favor, three opposed, and one neutral. Uh, the one neutral one was talking about grandfathering in uh, those that had uh, gas leaf blowers now, uh, but, it, but in favor of a ban going forward. Um, and then, you know, again, all this is non-scientific, not enough sampling to be able to really say anything in one way or the other. But residents who have switched to landscapers that do not use motorized leaf blowers in the, or motorized blowers in the summer have found that cleanup after mowing have found no visual difference in their property appearance. I'm being one of those. I've told my landscaper, when you get done with my mowing and cleanup, 
don't blow at all. I don't care if there's a bunch of clippings on my, my driveway. Um, so what ends up happening now, instead of him taking 10, 15 minutes to do my uh, yard every day, every week, he takes about five minutes and he's gone and I have a few clippings here and there and I really don't care. Uh, and residents who have switched to landscapers that use electric equipment in the summer have experienced a slight increase in cost over previous years. At least that's the experience from the few people that the SAB members have spoke to. Again, non-scientific. Next steps. Um, I'm hoping that we get an approval of the legislation. If we do, then we're going to organize, we're going to start to work to organize a training program for the town. Uh, we'll hopefully with town support. Um, we'll develop the and pre present educational seminars for residents and landscapers uh, and commercial property owners. That's my presentation, and I uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rand. Rand, are you able to stay with us um, for the public comments? I will be here. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, and I realize that we have uh, Drew Gamels and, and Nick Ward Willis are still with us on on the uh, the line as well, um, who have been uh, the folks crafting the language and the legislation itself. Yeah, um, and I, so I thank them for all of their help doing all of this. Thank you, especially Drew. Um, so with that said, um, we're we're ready to open up the floor to public comment. Uh, we'll do we'll do this the same way that we did uh, public comments on the previous public hearing. Um, we ask that if possible, please limit yourself to three minutes. Um, Christina Papes, our town clerk, will keep time for us again. Um, and you know, it's we, we just we appreciate that because we have with two public hearings in one evening, um, it, it does make a big difference for all of us and, and our families too. <laughs> So thank you for that. Um, and uh, if you want to be heard, um, please go ahead and raise your hand using the uh, the hand raising mechanism on your Zoom. You want to start with Barry's questions while we're waiting for people to raise their hand? Sure. So I'm flipping back over to my email. Um, there are five questions here, so I'll go ahead and read them out loud. Um, the first question is, number one, how many people on the SAB do their own landscaping? It's important to get a perspective, especially if they don't maintain their own property. This ordinance will not impact them personally. It impacts the landscapers and residents that do their own yard work. Number two, there have been comments made that, quote, no leaves fall during the summer. When storms, wind, etc., occur during the during the summer, then leaves fall, evident by what accumulates in the storm drain. Number three, at one of the previous public hearings, an expert spoke about the impact of leaf blower noise and exhaust on children. I don't understand why the school district is exempt. Can you please explain? This is a cause for concern. Number four, if electric leaf blowers exceed the noise limitations contained in this ordinance, will they still be allowed to be utilized? Number five, I'm deeply concerned that people in town like myself who want to keep clean, keep, who want to clean and keep their property neat and use leaf blowers to maintain our property are being penalized when nothing is being done to address the, uh, the fuller property uh, on King Street, which um, Barry says is an eyesore. Uh, this has been allowed to be in a state of disarray for three years. Um, so I'll, I'll take a couple of these and then I'll let um, other town board members have a crack at it too. Um, the number two, which was about leaves falling in the, in the summer um, and, and storm related events. We do have a mechanism within the local law um, for the town to suspend the, uh, the leaf blower ordinance to suspend the gas powered ban during the summer months if there is an emergency um, or, or storm event that would require us to do so in order to be able to clean up. Um, so that's, that's my first comment. And the second thing I wanted to address um, is if electric leaf blowers exceed the noise limitations contained in this ordinance. So there are no noise limitations in the ordinance anymore. So one of the things that the town board uh, working with the SAB has uh, done this year 
um, is to eliminate some of the earlier um, decibel levels that we're, we were attempting to regulate through the legislation. Um, and so the, the legislation does not specifically speak to uh, noise limitations at this point. So I, I have answered a couple. I don't know if any of the other town board members uh, or if Drew or Nick want to weigh in on any of the other issues that Barry raised. Is there something on cost? Was that, was that Barry, was that his first question or second question? Have I missed, I know there's a bunch and I may have. No. no? Okay. Ivy, can I just add to your comment about about the noise, uh, the no actual decibel levels. We we did change it. You know, one of the problems was enforcing the decibel levels with leaf blowers. They tend to just automatically go over, and it's very difficult to measure what the decibel level is for leaf blowers. So the restrictions in the local law are just a different way to address noise concerns as well, in addition to decibel levels. Because there is, a, it is difficult to to enforce and to measure the volume. I want to just quickly read the, well, the ones you didn't answer because I forgot what the questions were. And maybe sure. So the the first one is, do the people on the SAB do their own landscaping, um, and whether the Ivy? I think I can answer that in that uh, I don't know scientific. I don't know totally, but I do believe a number of the people on the SAB do do their own landscaping. Um, so that was the first one. The second one I addressed, which is the, the summer storm events. Uh, the third one is about the, oh, about the school district. So the exemption for the school district and the exemption for the town um, are limited to um, the um, ball fields and the tennis courts. So it's not the entirety of the property. I don't know if anybody else on the town board wants to weigh in on that or Nick or Drew, did I, did I get that right? I think that initially with the progression of this law, initially the whole school and other areas were exempted, but we thought that, you know, it just was fair to, if we're exempting town ball fields, we should ex exempt school ball fields. Um, same with tennis courts, but to not, um, we're not exempting the school district as a whole. So that's an important, you know, we're not exempting like school parking lots, for instance, and hardscapes. It's only fields and, you know, tennis courts and yeah. So I think we've uh, addressed all of the, the questions there. So um, Barry, we thank you for your, for your questions and your comments. Lyle, can we bring in? Yeah, we have David coming in. Hi, good evening. David, take yourself off. There you go. Yep, I'm on. Hi, uh, David Brooklocker here. Um, just a couple of quick questions. I, I know the discussions have been going on for some time, uh, and I have a particular interest as there's a lot of leaf blowing around me, and I have an asthmatic wife and daughter, uh, as well as an aversion to such noise. But um, uh, when, one was, uh, did we or did the board consider actually a longer period of uh, of having a gas powered leaf ban uh, to include the spring per se, um, because there isn't a great deal of leaves that need to be blown. And if there's an opening, uh, they will be used for any um, minute amount of clearing that needs to be done. Right. So uh, the second one uh, just addresses the enforcement uh, aspects, you know, where do you report an infringement to uh, what would happen to uh, you know, the land landscaper or homeowner if, if they are indeed uh, um, you know, violating that ban? Thank you. So maybe I'll take the first question and then uh, Drew, if you wanna weigh in on the, the second piece. So the, the first piece was just, did we consider a longer period? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, we've considered, we've definitely considered longer periods. We trimmed the stack at the request of residents. Um, you know, I, I can speak personally to this. I have a giant oak tree that is right over my deck and drops these catkins. Um, and it happens every Memorial Day weekend. Um, and they are these sort of seed packets and they go everywhere. 
Um, so there are still spring cleanup activities that um, I think people uh, have raised concerns about that go right up until uh, June 1st. And so I think in response to requests from the community, we dialed that back and that's why it starts on June 1st. Um, you know, I will say, and I think we've said before that um, to a certain extent, this is a starting point as the um, technology continues to get better and as we as a community uh, continue to get better <laughs> and, and adapt. Um, I think there are opportunities for the board to continue to, to consider expanding the period uh, in the future. But this felt like a, um, a compromise uh, and one that was, was sort of backed up with, with some rationale behind it. So that's, that's my attempt to take the longer period question. Um, Drew, can you speak to the enforcement question? Ivy, I could take it. I'm oh, still here. Uh, yeah, the, the report should be made to the police department. Uh, we would send an officer, uh, you know, I would imagine if it was the first um, incident in dealing with a landscaper, we would issue a warning, again, look for voluntary compliance. We would document the incident. And if we had a repeat uh, offense at an individual house or involving that same landscaper or landscaping company, a summons would be issued and they required to appear in court. Thank you very much for those comments and, and qu your questions, David. Okay, we have Roger Blank. Just take yourself off mute. Unmute it. I just had a question, I, and I, I posed this before to the board. Uh, we have a large property, we've got 18 acres, and we don't back up against anybody except for Whippoorwill Park and a couple of neighbors who are quite, quite distant. Um, and using a, an electric blower, we have an electric blower that we own, and using that doesn't take us very far on our property. Uh, we would suggest that you provide an exemption for large properties uh, because the, the risk of, of uh, imposing on neighbors is much less. Um, we, we have a landscaper to do our, 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 our landscaping, but uh, I think if you had an exemption for say 10 acres or more, um, it would be along the lines of allowing the schools and the uh, cemeteries and everybody else, so the large, uh, large properties to, uh, to not be subjected to what is essentially designed for a, a small, you know, one or two acre um, parcel. I mean, if our, if our property were divided into five or six different properties, you'd have a bunch of small properties with a lot more noise and pollution and whatnot than with a, you know, a large property like ours. And so I suggest that you, that you build in an exemption for properties that are 10 acres or more. Thank you, Roger, for those comments. I don't know if anybody on the town board wants to speak to how we landed where we did. I mean, I can, I can certainly, you know, uh, Roger, we've gone um, up and down both sides of the road on this particular issue a couple of times. Um, and the challenge for us was that it, we couldn't figure out how many acres uh, would feel equitable. So it, it became an equity question. Uh, why would we be penalizing people who had smaller lots versus larger lots? And, and it felt as though um, in order to have a law that was uh, universal and enforceable and equitable, um, that uh, not having a carve out uh, for a particular size lot uh, was reasonable. And, you know, I would just um, sort of, um, speak to the, the issue that you raised with regard to, you know, well, wh why is there, what's the difference between a, a large lot private property versus uh, a cemetery or a, uh, a ball field? Uh, and the difference is that those have public uses. Um, and so the entirety of those properties need to be maintained um, and they have a volume of people coming through and using those properties. Um, and so they need to be maintained for public health reasons. Um, as, or and or you know in the in the case of a cemetery uh, for the purposes there so that's uh, you know my perspective as to how we got to where we are today um, and if anybody else wants to weigh in please feel free I see some nodding heads but okay uh, we have no more hands up right at the moment oh 
Now we have some. Uh, Maxine uh, got in first, so let her. Maxine, take yourself off mute. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Hi, everybody. First off, um, aside from the leaf blower, um, thank you for the, the diligence and leadership on the mask issue. Um, and on a lot of issues, and which is why I think it's important that the leaf blower initiative and, and goes into effect because you're leading by example and the benefits to me are very important for health, safety, um, environmentally excellent in terms of not blowing away our pollinators. You know, there's another side to leaf blowing you know, I see hap happening all the time. They're blowing now and they're blowing dirt and they're blowing insects and they're blowing bees and they're blowing things all over. It's like, uh, it's like when you see five or six leaf, leaf blowers going off at the same time on Ludlow Drive, you, you can't even walk, let alone think about what they're doing to the properties. Um, I mean, I could see hardscapes being cleared in the summer, but now I just don't understand why you know this has to be happening and if and if it is happening it should be with equipment that's greener and it's technologically better to have electric um, we're in the 21st century and the landscapers have to you know come up with adapting and um and i think it's very important that we we get the landscapers to know how you know, we feel about this and especially landscapers from other towns coming in, but just basically, it's just, it's for everyone to have a better existence in our community without the noise, without the pollution. And I just feel it's important that we do something and get this into place. And that's, that's all I wanna say. Thank you, Maxine, we appreciate your comments tonight and as well as the ones that you've made um, throughout the work that the town board's been doing on this. Okay, we have Victoria. Greetings. Welcome. So thank you for having this uh, public hearing and many thanks to Rand for all of his efforts on the SAB um, and pulling all this together over the years. Um, my very first question is, is the board planning to vote on this tonight? No, definitely not. <laughs> but we know that this has been a, a topic that there's been a lot of interest in. We have already had a very late night tonight. Um, and we uh, obviously have a, had a public hearing right before this one. So we know that there are people who did not get the opportunity to join and we wanna make sure that we've heard you know, from everyone and giving everyone a chance to speak. So yes, this will absolutely be open. Okay. I, think to, I think to add on to that, it's not uh, absolutely we want uh, more pu public input, but I think even more so that, you know, it doesn't take it, it won't go into effect uh, until June 1st of next year anyway. And so the, you know, immediate urgency to vote on the same day as we're discussing it is, is just less, uh, less necessary. Okay. I'm sorry, Victoria, to interrupt. Jason, we have in the local law that it goes into effect October 1st, 2020. Is uh, that, is the board want to change? Is that something to discuss uh, further? But it is October no, no. 1st. My, my bad. Yes, correct. Uh, no it does go into effect uh, October, uh, October 2020. The, the, the need, however, from October till, till June 1st, uh, gas leaf blowers are still uh, uh, allowed to be used. So. It just has less of an impact. Okay, I hear you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I guess, you know, I truly do appreciate the interest uh, that the SCB has and that the town board has in finding, you know, one whatever happy medium exists in terms of satisfying the needs and interests of, um, you know, the most residents. Uh, and I guess I'm just struggling a little bit with um, not wanting us to miss an opportunity here as a town, you know, as evidenced in the law you just passed, which obviously is an extreme situation during a pandemic. Um, but this is a different type of opportunity to really be a leader um, and, you know, 
the words feel good come to mind for me. You know, doing something that we as a community can feel proud of um, in leading the way around combating climate change together and having a community effort. You know, it's almost like I see it as the days that we have cleanup in town that everyone feels excited about, you know, grabbing a bag and picking up litter. And we all feel like we're doing it for ourselves, for our community, for the environment. And it's something that makes us all feel good. And we know we're having an impact. And I guess kind of to that end, when we start thinking about the, the goals, the climate change goals um, the SAB had originally and still has, um, and that many community members have as well. And I think as residents of the planet, you know, we all have a greater and greater understanding of just how bad climate change is and how important it is to take um, really meaningful, impactful efforts um, that don't just kind of dip our toes into the ocean kind of thing, but really make a strong statement. And you know, if you think about, and I don't want to go over my three minutes, I'll be, I'll be sensitive here, but um, you know, you think about Bedford 2020, I mean, they set a goal and really have now documented uh, the impact on climate change that they've had as a community. And I guess I, you know, I just want to put out there that when we're coming up with these compromises and the exem exemptions, and I understand the public safety exemptions, um, but it makes a statement when we say we are all doing something about this. And, um, and to try not to compromise too much in that regard. Um, and I do want to also pick up Victoria, on- we, we're showing you the time sign here. Can you uh, okay. give us kind of a wrap up? Uh, sure, I don't see it, but it's, I, I totally I get that it's there. Um, and the other thing is just to kind of pick up on what Maxine was saying. This is also about particulate matter. And the person who spoke about a family member with asthma, family members with asthma, um, particulate matter is still blown by electric leaf blowers. Um, and so to that end, I guess the specific action I'd like you to take is think about the weekend hours. They feel a little bit too long. We don't have any time that we can say in our community during daylight hours that, we, <laughs> that we're not using leaf blowers um, to give a reprieve uh, for all of us to say, as a community, we're committing to not using leaf blowers on a certain day or you know, after three o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays. So I'd like you to think about, you know, is there any extra room there to be a little bit more um, aggressive around that, um, I think is really important. And also to kind of put somewhere, I think you kind of alluded to this. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually ask you to, to wrap up here. We're trying to keep everybody to, uh, to three minutes this evening. Um, I think we, we got the gist of the, the comments here. Any closing sentence? Okay, I think we lost you. Um, anybody comments? I just wanted to say the closing line, please. Um, you had mentioned earlier, Ivy, that this was gonna be revisited in the future. So I just was thinking if we could put that in writing in the language of the law, that in a couple of years we'll revisit, maybe we can be even you know, more bold on this. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone have any response, comments? I think we're all starting to uh, feel the effects of our fourth hour of the town board meeting. Nobody, <laughs> nobody with their hands raised. Okay, we have nobody else with hands raised. So, you know, listen, um, I, like I said, we're, we're in our fourth hour. We're all starting to fade a little bit. I can I can see everybody kind of rubbing their, their temples. Um, this is a really important topic and we wanna make sure that we appropriately hear from the community on it um, and that we give everybody the opportunity to be heard um, and that we give our best selves in our responses to the comments that we hear from people. Um, Jill, when can we uh, continue the public hearing? Do you have the calendar? Yeah, I'm taking a look at it now. So um, our schedule for the summer is uh, July 21st and then um, August 11th. Um, and then we start back again in September. So um, it's really up to the board as to whether or not um, you want to kick it over to October, uh, October, August, or September. 
tie for August. Let's see. Uh, Jeremy, you were about to talk. I jumped in front of you. I was going to say, let's try for August. Let's see how many responses and comments we get in August. And then if we need to have a third public hearing, we certainly can. Okay. Okay, so we're going to set this as adjourned to August 11th? Yes. Okay, thank and you. Can we make sure that we get the video of this available on our prominently on our website so that you know we can point people back to Rand's really comprehensive, very lovely presentation at the top. Yeah, Rand, maybe what we should do is get a copy of the presentation and that way it could be separately posted in addition, okay. um, only because it was three plus hours in before we got to your presentation, um, maybe. No problem. I'll send Terrific. It Thank you so much. We've also been in a debate right now because we've sort of internally discussed. Uh, I, Rand, I do support the concept of the programs, the buyback type programs, and um, certainly I'm not committing money from the town, but I think that it's a good idea, and I'm not opposed to finding money if we can from the town. Speaking solely for myself, but I think to, not just to incentivize, but to help with the burden. Uh, especially in difficult financial times to to make that change. So I think that's something great. I don't know if there's grant programs out there. I don't know if you can help find other private folks who will uh, get involved, but, but the more the more dollars, just like anything else, the better. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Rand, to, to that point, Rand, are you, to Jeremy's point, are you seeing other towns do that? I know Bedford, for instance, they said they, you know, are seeking to find discounts for everyone and perhaps do group discounts, look at, um, you know, what's available, but is there any towns you've seen that are actually giving funds to do this? The, the, the answer is yes, but no one's ready to commit until we have a legislation in place. So, you know, the others have done it when they've had, pro, when they've had legislations in place to do it with, but, uh, I'm sorry, others have done, have given, towns have given money to residents? Towns have given money. In California, it's very common. Mm -hmm. uh, in the East Coast, it's it's um, not as common, but there hasn't been as many towns that have gone that route yet. Mm -hmm. um, in when, when, I, when I've spoke to Sustainable Westchester, uh, they, they started doing it uh, two years ago, um, but they end up traction. Uh, there is evidently another town, and they won't name who it is, who's looking to do this right now. Uh, if we were to jump on the wagon, uh, it might give them the impetus to move forward. Um, that was the best I can get out of them at this point in time. Um, so the, the answer is, it, it wasn't definitive, in other words. I, I couldn't get them to give me any more than that. Um, they said, you know, get, if you have the legislation, we might be able to have it pushed further. Um, but without the legislation, I've heard the story before, and they weren't willing to dance with me any further, to use vernacular on it. So I, I really couldn't get much further with much sustainable. We can probably explore this more later. I think we'll all been discussing it. So and that's basically what it came down to. I, I couldn't go much further with anybody uh, on it, but I, I got a lot of good words from people and a lot of yeah, we can probably move this forward. Um, well, let's keep on talking. And I said, well, the town's very interested now. Can we talk further? They said, yeah, let's just keep on talking. Okay. 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 Okay, everyone. Thank you, Rand. My pleasure. Thank you. So we will reconvene on this topic on August 11th. And did I get the right? Did August we 11th? actually have a motion? I'll move. We need a motion. I'll move. Exactly. To, to what date? To August 11th? August 11th. Sorry. I guess I have to be more specific, but yes. Yeah, Second to August 11th. All in favor? Aye. 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 In the meantime, people can continue to submit comments to town clerk at mynewcastle.org and or town board at mynewcastle.org. Great. Okay. okay. Well, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to bed. So. <laughs> See you all then. All right. Motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone.